As you can see, on this slide, we have three types of reaction. Reaction to injury, reaction to irritation, and reaction to return to sport. Now, I will ask you to focus more on exploring the three phases. As I said, Tom Hobbs and Paul, in developing the phases approach, indicated that each of the stages is associated with specific psychosocial responses. During the first phase, response to injury, athletes often experience negative and cognitive appraisals. In the second phase, response to rehabilitation, injured athletes may face with motivational challenges. In the third one, response to return to play or termination of career, athletes may experience self-confidence issues and fears or anxiety about the injury. Let's talk about the first phase, reaction to injury. In this phase, athletes reported changes in their cognitive appraisal and increased emotional reaction following their diagnosis. In other words, some athletes reported that being aware of the severity of their injuries promoted a positive attitude regarding their condition, while others expressed negative thoughts or perceived their health condition as negative or challenging to overcome. What we can learn from this, this, first, this first phase, the most common behavioral responses that athletes have shown and will require at these early stages of injury is to seek social support and more specifically social support from their care provider and physician rather than their family and teammates. What about the second phase, reaction to post-surgery rehabilitation? During this phase, the imagined topic in athletes' cognitive appraisal was characterized by thoughts and questions during the rehabilitation process, and injured athletes may be faced with motivational challenges. The most common emotional response to rehabilitation appeared to be frustration. In accordance with early phases of the rehabilitation process, athletes still reported seeking social support as their primary behavior response. As the injured athletes move into the middle stages of their rehabilitation programs, some athletes experience apathy and poor attitudes, like doing too much or too little, which could be a result of lack of motivation to complete the required rehabilitation exercises or a sign of anticipation and willingness to return to sport. The third phase, reaction to return to sport. Finally, this phase, we can notice that athletes may face self-confidence challenges and fears or anxiety about risk of re-entry. Following the cognitive assessment above, feelings of excitement and anxiety about the injury were a common topic among the, among the emotional responses during the return to sport phase. Some athletes were very excited to return to sport, while others felt insecure about their ability to return to sport and the possibility to be injured again. Despite our best effort, assist our athletes in promoting awareness to their treatment and support and to support them psychologically based on this scientific model of intervention. The question is, when is it most appropriate to make a decision to refer the patient to a psychologist? The reason when any care provider takes the decision to refer the patient to the psychologist, this referral may be divided into two main categories. The first one is prevention or preventive approach. The prevention is proactive 
and made default images of psychological issues to facilitate, to faci faci facilitate rehabilitation and to return to sport, such as athletes with significant life changes or athletes with complicated rehabilitation. The second approach, remediation, is a reactive approach and made in deep thoughts to evident psychological difficulties in personal or social function. Of course, the proactive approach is highly recommended. Let me now to give you some examples when it is appropriate to refer a patient, injured a patient to the psychologist. When you notice that your patient lacks confidence in his or her ability to recover, this is the time to refer this patient to psychologist or sports psychologist. Second case, if you observe that your patient lacks or has difficulties to concentrate during rehabilitation or during session, it means uh, your patient is struggling with the deficit in attention and could be a sign of anxiety. At this time, you can refer this patient to the psychologist. If you notice that your patient does not make effort because of fear, you have many cases in hospital, the patient is showing that he's doing his best, but he's, he's controlling his movement and he, he, he tried to do, to do his best just to show to his physiotherapist that uh, he's engaged. That, but uh, really, this patient can have some problems with anxiety, anxiety or fear to injure himself. We have other case when you notice that your patient easily loses focus when pain increases or when discouraged. I, mean, I can give you an example. I received a patient, uh, it's an athlete, in my, in my consultation, and uh, his, main, his main complaint is um, that his, his um, physiotherapist is not paying more attention about, about his effort. During our discussion, I discovered that this patient is struggling with, uh, with, uh, with pain acceptance. The pain for him is, is a relevant factor that impedes his effort and uh, even he's, he showed that he's doing his best, but he's protecting with himself. As you can see, this patient even is showing that he's uh, working properly, but deeply he's struggling with his anxiety to re-injure himself. This is one of the reasons to refer the patient to the psychologist. If you notice, that your patient engages in excessive cognitive thinking on simple tasks. You can ask him many questions about how to spend his body for himself. At every single session, he's asking the same questions. This is a sign that your patient needs to be referred to the psychologist. But as you know, um, sometimes it's difficult to um, convince anyone to visit the psychologist. But hopefully, in more than 14 years, I think we did a good job with my colleague how to, um, to propose our services in the right manner. Um, almost all the patients uh, had this uh, mistakes or misunderstanding about, about our role. Our role is not about personality disorders, 
It's mainly about psychological troubles of disorders, like problems with concentration, problems with how to motivate ourselves, or how to communicate in the right way and to communicate better. If you have a patient does not know how to set and achieve significant goals, sometimes when you, you discuss with your patient, in your patient, he is focusing just on, on the session. If you ask him about his goal plan, what is what he is um, planned for the next couple of days or month. Sometimes it's, um, it's tricky to discover that your patient is more focusing on his pain or is more focusing on his need than about his mental vision. If you have a patient, you will pay attention more on the results that perhaps he will fail or perhaps he can get use it again. Be sure your patient will be more anxious. However, if you have a patient and you can help him to direct his mind more on tasks, to tell him how to motivate himself to focus more on his task when he's when he's doing his physio, encourage him to focus more on his task rather to focus on the results. Focusing on the results, this is, this is a reason how we can, uh, the reason to lead to anxiety. Now, if you have a patient, that he has difficulty managing thoughts about the injury or worries about the injury, uh, that you can you can, you can notice that your patient um, is not focusing on his uh, tasks uh, rather than he will, uh, he will ask a question how he seems to be disconnected from the reality. It's like he's absent. You need to pay attention about the, about the body language, more about, about the words. Just to let me to give you an example. It's better to uh, to say your message in the right way. But the better message, how you can you say it in different way. It means whatever you are doing, how you are doing, whatever you are saying, how you are saying it, the manner how you establish the communication with your your, your patients is important, is part of relationship. And in the end of our lecture, you can see that one of the main message is about social support. In different phases, the main message that more you are providing good relationship, more providing more good um, services, this kind of behavior we help the patient to be more aware about himself and to feel confident and we be convinced by the rehabilitation plan. In case you have a patient that does not have proper over negative self-talk, just I want to, to summarize in, in few words. How you can identify someone mentally is functioning well? If this person has the ability to, to control the self-talk, the one is negative, not the one is positive. The psychology, this is the psychology is the ability of anyone to have this, this power of the skill to manage his self-talk. In the case of patients, when you have a patient who has mainly negative self-talk, he has negative perception of his um, creative plan, he's talking a lot about his pain, he's um, describing that he is trying
striving with the with that fish plan. This kind of points are too much important to understand that your patient has negative self talk. More you pay attention about the discussion and how he's talking to you, the way he's talking to you, it's not about the words used by your patient, it's the manner how he's talking to you. Take this occasion to pay attention and to understand if your patient is struggling or your patient is convex and is look is working forward to complete his rehabilitation. If you have a, a case of patient, you want to maximize the effectiveness of rehabilitation in different way, on different words, he is, he is working over and over. This is a case of patient has some difficulties uh, to manage his anxiety. For him to protect himself and to protect his, his knee is to, to work over and over. Uh, this is more related to how the patient is managing his anxiety and how the patient is managing his self talk Let me to conclude. Here are the important points to keep in mind. What we learn, what we learn together, that physical aspect of rehabilitation is is not sufficient to assist our patient in therapy to complete the treatment and to go back to the previous spot reference level. Psychosocial factors are, are too much important, are associated with physical aspects, and we need to notice and to observe that these psychosocial factors are important and they, these factors will, will, will assist our patients to go through this continuum and to go back on the field. Understanding and identifying how the psychosocial reactions of addicts interact during the different phases of rehabilitation allows the healthcare provider to better understand and to help patients to face the challenges. And we give you the opportunity to assist the patient to manage the psychosocial factors. What is the purpose? The purpose it means for the patient when I'm working with them, I will tell them that we have, you have two objectives. The first one, you need to complete your surgery. The second objective, you need to complete your your rehabilitation. And specifically rehabilitation is not a matter of physical aspect. Based on this model, we understand that cognitive assessment, how you perceive your physiotherapist, your surgeon, your physician, is too much important. If you perceive your healthcare provider in a negative way, your perception will affect your rehabilitation and your performance. If the patient is perceiving his care provider in the right way, in the positive way, surely you have some, some argument that your patient will go forward his treatment and will be back to his sport performance level. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, the first question to uh, from Mod, uh, Montaza from Iran. He wants to ask questions. Uh, please, Montaza from uh, yeah. Iran, your question, please. 
Yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Do you know the word now? Nice to have art. Si. Uh, would you please let me know if you can hear me very well? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Thanks a lot, dear Professor Kerry. It was a really good and exciting topic regarding sports psychology. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about the best strategies for relieving and for making the injured athletes in a best perfect manner during the rehabilitation process. Your topic was about the reasons for uh, having a sports psychologist for injured athletes. In my opinion, in my, based on my practical experiences in uh, athlete events, it's obviously clear that we need sports psychologists. But my question uh, is about uh, which strategy uh, uh, would make the best role for relieving the athletes, the injured athletes. As you know, and as all of you know, all the injured athletes always have low self-confidence, low self-reliance, okay, because of poor physical conditioning. For example, in our uh, university, or for as a sports psychologist of my uh, sport teams, we always work on uh, their competitive motivation. Okay. For example, some practice in life, mental major techniques, I don't know, observational uh, practicing or learning or something like this. But based on your uh, research experience, which one is better than the other ones as a strategy for making the injured athletes come back to sport events as soon as possible? I would be grateful if you provide an appropriate response for me. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Based on my experience in hospital, uh, the best strategy is confidence. If you have a tool to be uh, clear about your um, your plan, and this is what I'm, I'm doing my best uh, towards my colleagues physiotherapists. Treatment is is treatment is a relationship. If you succeed in this relationship with your patient as a surgeon, as a physician, as a physiotherapist, as a psychologist, if it's convinced by what? By your competence or your, 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 your skills to understand the patient and the skills to support the patient. For me, the best strategy is how you can build your, your trust with your patient. My way of working in Aspeta, uh, the first step to know the profile. Um, I am uh, I am MBTI, MBTI Mir Briggs Type Indicator is a scientific tool to um, to profile any any one. It's based on on, on scientific theory and we have 16, what is it? 16 profile. If you have someone, a uh, logical person, logical person it means uh, you have two skills. You have emotions and we have the other aspects of ourselves is thinking, perception, decision. What happens if you are someone who is thinker, you will focus more about task. You will focus more about your logical uh, aspect of discussion. If you give him what he's looking for, as you are sports athletes, maybe you are more logical person, you need to get clear message. You need to have a clear plan and you need to you need to have a clear support. If you can get the three three uh, services we'll be we'll be happy and we start to trust you. The best strategy for me is the trust based on communication and based on the, as I mentioned in my topic you have three different phases. For every single phase like the first one response to injury may uh, main difficulty is about uh, appraisal, cognitive appraisal. If you have someone is is more negative aspects about his treatment, it means our way to discuss with him, our way how to develop the best strategy uh, is to to accept that these things is 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 almost normal, and we need to go through why he's thinking the negative way to understand.
understand the reason, based as I mentioned on to know the profile, to get the, the, the clear, uh, clear message. Working in Aspetar, Aspetar is, um, is a hospital uh, dedicated for, for athletes, for surgery and sport, uh, and sport medicine. And we are working closely with surgeon, okay. with fitness, I with the Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear professor. That was a very good and very nice uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Karim Khaleti, for your presentation and uh, have, uh, have a nice day. Uh, thank you. Dr. Karim? I'm listening to you. Dr. Karim, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
standards with respect to using a cup or a tourniquet system whereby you would be applying an external pressure on the proximal area of the either your upper limb or the lower limb with respect to inflating the cup there is a gradual mechanical compression that could uh, be felt with uh, the beneath your cup with respect to this there could be a partial obstruction of your arterial blood supply to the distal uh, muscles at the same time you are almost severely impacting the venous blood supply that uh, leads to kind of complete uh, reduction in terms of uh, the venous return thereby impacting your cardiac output at the same time uh, earlier there were uh, the usual cuffs that would be present for the tourniquet system using uh, the uh, numerical system uh, but now the recent development with the help of recent developments uh, even your wireless modes of cup are available in the market where which could be operated with respect to your smartphones in terms of the major benefits that uh, you can expect with respect to the blood flow restriction are predominantly your strength and uh, muscular hypertrophy with respect to the strength it has been suggested that with the uh, resistance training uh, you can expect around 8 to 15 percentage of improvement when you perform the similar activity without any uh, blood flow restriction at the same time even your cross sectional area of the muscles have significantly improved mainly due to the stress of the hypoxic environment that has been created within the muscle uh, mainly indicating that this type of training blood flow restriction training is uh, mainly helping in terms of lesser mechanical stress on the muscular system and giving them the heavy uh, benefits that would be significantly uh, seen or almost similar to what you can expect with the normal resistance training. In terms of applications, most of the practitioners all around the globe and the research work are predominantly focusing on a resistance based training where with a minimal load you are expected to get a significant benefit that the load could be as low as 20 to 40 percentage of your one arm and the next pattern could be or the next type of exercises could be uh, your aerobic exercises such as your walking and cycling or jogging and uh, in terms of this walking and uh, cycling are predominantly uh, explored in terms of research work but the research work or the magnitude of research work when we compare with the resistance training the aerobic training still lacks a uh, lot of clarity in this aspect and the next type of application of your BFR could be your passive BFR wherein uh, you are expected this uh, to be uh, mainly in terms of rehabilitation part where you can try to avoid the atrophy of the muscle and a uh, lot of which uh, literature in terms of ACL surgeries have been done with respect to BFR training uh, wherein this could be done without any exercises just a stationary uh, position and you are restricting the blood supply to the distal part of the uh, limb could take way for the maintenance or slightly better improvement in terms of cross sectional area of the muscle and also to try to maintain the strength which could help the uh, individual to come back faster to his uh, original state. There are various factors that could uh, influence your adaptations or responses with respect to BFR training. Uh, in terms of the first and foremost could be your cuff pressure. How much of pressure you need to actually apply to elicit significant amount of changes. So repressors are usually divided with respect to the determining the actual pressure that could be implied where they have uh, done with respect to arbitrary pressure which ranges from 50 mm pressure to 300 mm pressure as well 
and the next one could be your systolic blood pressure where by determining the systolic blood pressure and implying a few percentage of the blood pressure but this is not very well correlated with respect to the actual pressure that the individual would be perceived and arterial occlusion pressure where uh, this is the combination of your systolic blood pressure and the thickness of your cuff could lead to arterial occlusion pressure and limb occlusion pressure is nothing but your tissue flow which will be obstructed and the percentage of this could be a uh, more preferred way to uh, perform the BFR type of training. The other one could be how much of the tightness that the individual would be perceiving would determine the actual pressure. If you compare the different modes of uh, cuff pressure that could be implied, uh, arterial occlusion pressure or limb occlusion pressure are most preferred in terms of the literature, but the amount of pressure is hugely varied within the literature. And the next parameter could be your cuff width ranging from 3 cm to 18 cm. Your cuff width uh, in the sense even the length of the cuff could uh, influence with respect to the cuff width. Uh, the, usually the lesser the cuff width it requires higher amount of uh, pressure to elicit significant amount of blood flow restriction. Whereas if you have a wider cuff, that requires an absolutely less amount of pressure in terms of uh, your blood flow restriction. Remember that if we are saying somewhat around 40 percentage of arterial occlusion pressure or 60 percentage of limb occlusion pressure, it doesn't mean that we are obstructing the blood supply of 60 percentage to the working muscle. It's based on the pressure that is exerted but the magnitude of the blood supply restric is restricted is would be still unknown and the third parameter could be your cuff material in terms of cuff material both elastic and uh, nylon cuffs are predominantly used and almost both did show a significant amount of improvement uh, in terms of your muscular strength and hypertrophy but there is not much significant difference in terms of which cuff material to be used in general. In terms of scenarios this could be very well applied in the individual who has low functioning that includes a sedentary individual or obese individual. These people could uh, elicit uh, significantly better or the higher magnitude of benefits in terms of the strength, the uh, hypertrophy, cardiovascular uh, fitness, in terms of aerobic capacity, aerobic exercise, which is more feasible and more convenient and with very minimal uh, equipment that would be required, this form of exercise could be more applicable to the community setup in general and because of the COVID situation around the globe, more focus has been shifted to training at home where they could be performing uh, with minimal equipments and the blood flow restriction is a ideal form, ideal mode of exercise that could uh, be beneficial in terms of the individuals. In terms of immediate responses, there are several studies that have been done with respect to this study by Kumani at 2012. They have demonstrated on a time basis. So that is your excess responses or your cardiovascular cardio responses at 10th minute, 20th minute and 30th minute during your cycling at a 60 percentage of the uh, VO2 max have demonstrated that your heart rate would usually increase significantly till the 10th minute and after that the magnitude of change could not be uh, seen in terms of uh, significant values. 
Similarly, your stroke volume could be decreased, and uh, your even though you can expect some uh, difference in arteriovenous oxygen difference, but the oxygen uptake is significantly higher in terms of the individuals performing the blood flow restriction exercises. And this is another study by uh, Thomas at 2018, which have demonstrated a hemodynamic responses with respect to low intensity aerobic exercises combined with low intensity BFR exercises. And they are also compared with the high intensity without the blood flow restriction. So here you can see that the low intensity without blood flow restriction usually uh, provides a significant amount, a lesser amount of pressure that the individual would perceive. At the same time, with respect to high intensity activities or high intensity excesses, your blood pressure or systolic blood pressure is significantly higher in the magnitude. But low intensity of BFR is slightly lesser than the high intensity activities. But if you see in terms of the diastolic blood pressure, the low intensity BFR training is significantly increasing in terms of your uh, diastolic blood pressure, indicating that the mean arterial pressure is uh, significantly higher in terms of the individual performing the low intensity blood flow restriction exercises. This is an interesting study with respect to the hemodynamic responses that are compared uh, with respect to aerobic exercises, that is your treadmill walking and uh, resistance exercises at a 20 percentage of 1 RM. And they have compared the results of this resistance and uh, aerobic exercises, indicating that the difference is significantly higher in terms of the resistance exercises that your cardiorespiratory fitness or the cardiorespiratory parameters that include your heart rate, stroke volume, and your systolic blood pressure is uh, significantly higher in terms of the individuals performing resistance exercises than the individuals who are performing aerobic exercises. But they have also concluded that the amount of perceived exertion is significantly lesser in terms of the individuals performing aerobic exercises. So that they could be performing it uh, for a longer duration of time and they could be continuing with the exercises for uh, in terms of the uh, continuation. In terms of your chronic adaptations, the study done by Abe at 2006 have demonstrated in terms of the strength parameters around 8 to 10 percentage of improvement. At the same time, they have also demonstrated around 3.5 to 7 percentage of uh, improvement in the uh, cross sectional area of the muscle, and also 2.5 percentage of improvement was seen in terms of their VO2 levels when you compare with the same activity performed the, without the blood flow restriction. Uh, in terms of the cycling study, this was done with respect to a short duration of BFR training versus a long duration of normal training that consists of 15 minutes of cycling with BFR and 45 minutes of training without uh, BFR. This results have paved the way for that indicating that even a short duration of BFR training has shown a significant amount of improvement that, uh, in terms of your VO2 levels that consists of around 6.5 percentage of improvement in your VO2. At the same time, even your strength was improved by around 7 percentage and the cross sectional area of the muscle was also improved by 3 percentage. But the same was not seen on the individuals performing the cycling exercises for a prolonged period of time, indicating that even a short duration of BFR training is providing you the maximum benefits that you can receive from. In terms of Body weight exercises, the literature are uh, very minimal, but the current literature that is available compared the circuit training or progressive circuit training for eight weeks of time have demonstrated at least a three percentage of improvement in the cross sectional area of the muscle, uh, indicating uh, that even a body weight exercise is sufficient enough to improve 
with DFR training than without DFR training. At the same time, another study this was done on uh, older adults with respect to the strength being the primary outcome have demonstrated with respect to body weight exercises and dynamic balance test your body weight exercises automatically increased the strength in the individuals at the same time the their uh, reaction time or the capacity of the individuals is also significantly improved even though there are a lot of benefits that are associated with uh, BFR training there are a lot of concerns also that is that are arising but these concerns are of the fact that the improper applications of BFR training with respect to the study that was done in Brazil have demonstrated that around 71% of the professionals that are implementing the BFR training have felt that there is significant amount of tingling or domes or numbness with respect to the primary side effects that is associated with the blood flow restriction training. At the same time, the individuals that are contraindicated for the BFR type of training are the individuals with cardiovascular diseases or the thrombosis. As I said, the literature is significantly different or varying with respect to the results that are present. Uh, hence, Peterson and his colleagues at 2017 have shown the proper guidelines to be used for BFR training that includes your resistance training, the load of around 20 to 40 percentage of your 1RM and the cup width to be specific and repetitions. Usually the repetitions of your BFR training are kind of 75 repetitions that includes 30 repetitions in the beginning or the first set followed by 15 repetitions in the next subsequent 3 sets. At the same time uh, your aerobic training for the activities that is done on aerobic that includes your walking and cycling is performed under 50 percentage of your VO2 max and with the duration of around uh, 5 to 15 minutes of time and the occlusion pressure of around 40 to 80 percentage and in terms of passive BFR training the restriction time is uh, limited to 5 minutes and uh, this type of uh, restriction could be in a continuous mode currently we are working on a project that uh, would like to assess the different types of uh, aerobic exercises that includes body weight exercises we would assume that body weight exercises are basically aerobic in nature due to the fact that it consists of similar movement pattern and uh, body weight resistance body weight exercises could be performed in higher resolution with a uh, low load even though there is a difference of mechanical stress but the exercises are aerobic in nature is what we would like to assume and there are no literature evidence that is suggesting that uh, or that, that has compared with aerobic exercises and the body weight exercises so we would like to propose a topic called aero acute responses and chronic adaptations to body weight walking lunges and aerobic walking exercises with bed for restriction in sedentary uses the reason why we choose walking lunges is that uh, the movement pattern is almost similar to the walking exercises even though there is different uh, mechanical stress. So these are the team uh, that is working on this and thank you for your attention. Question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Definitely there is a uh, difference as we know that the musculature, muscular mass is uh, significantly different in the uh, upper and uh, lower limb. But at the same time it is also dependent on the pressure that we would like to uh, restrict the blood. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Dr. Nazir, good morning. Good morning, hi, can you hear me? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to be with us uh, for, uh, at, the, at the time. So, uh, thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Uh, I just need a confirmation, so... Can you hear me all? Yeah, 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 everything is okay, you can start, please. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, can you sh can you see my screen and the title of my talk? Uh, no, uh, you don't have your your screen. Let me just just a sec. We're far away. Maybe it's internet. Uh, it's delaying. Okay. You can. Uh, you can see it now. Uh, not full screen now. You have you have you have uh, you have. Uh, no. Okay, so the title of my talk is Spleen Contraction During Step Transition Exercise and I'm talking about the inside from the supervised side model. So, so sorry, I'm, it's not the full screen. Okay. It should be okay now. Let me just check if that's what I can check. Okay. Is this better? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, you can talk. Okay. So, the title of my talk is Clean Contraction During Step Transition Exercise and given an insight from the suit by cycling model. So, here in Split Croatia at the lab of integrative physiology, we do a lot of stuff related on cardiovascular, oxygen transport, and nowadays spleen contraction. So, here's a brief insight on the basics of the anatomy of the spleen. And we all know that the spleen is a highly vascular, vascularized organ and the largest immunological organ in the human body. 
And we are quite aware that with the ultrasound imaging, it's quite close, and therefore we can have a closer look on the spleen contractility during exercise. So the mongo superior splenic and the mongo inferior splenic actually allows us to see a 2 or a 3D image of the contracting spleen during exercise. And why is that important? So the, the, the primary function is the immune response. So it's the synthesis of antibodies, it's the filtration of the blood, and it's the elimination of the old blood cells. But secondly, it's also a reservoir of the red blood cell storage. So there are two different areas for storing the blood. So the venous sinus and the pulp actually play a role in the storing red blood cells. But besides that, the spleen is a sympathetically innervated organ controlled by the autonomic nervous system, as the textbook physiology says. And this advantage of storing red blood cells is widely used in animal world, where well seal has a large ability to store 67% of the body's erythrocytes at rest and uses them during its dives to find food. In terrestrial animals like horses, the spleen serves as a red blood cell reservoir with approximately 50% of densely packed red blood cell content in their spleen. In humans, it's quite different actually. It only contains about 150 to 200 milliliters of red blood cells and likely is to release around 8 to 10 percent of the total red blood cell content in the human body. However, this increase in hemoglobin concentration and red blood cells in general is transient and disappears within 2 to 10 minutes after physiological stress like apnea or exercise. So, some researchers believe that human spleen also played a role in enhancing oxygen transport. However, there is an ongoing debate whether or not splenic emptying actually facilitates oxygen transport. And we'll talk about it more during my presentation here. So the central question is that researchers, especially from Sweden, claim that spleen is mediated by hypoxia. And this is the primary driver of the AMS, uh, or other words, sympathetic nervous system activation. But a, a direct proof that splenic contraction arguments aerobic performance in humans is still lacking. However, it's beyond doubt that human spleen may decrease its size and substantially deliver much of its blood content in response to increased underground activity, regardless of whether the, this activity originates from the dreadful diving models or aerobic exercise. So the, the spleen contraction can theoretically increase the circulating red blood cell volume by 3 to 10 percent maximum. So the, the previous work was mostly related to dreadful diving models and the spleen function because the, the diving model is characterized with bradycardia, increased sympathetic efferent nerve activity, and vasoconstriction of the peripheral or local vascular beds. This actually uh, is translated into reduced cardiac output and reduced blood flow as characterized by the dry apnea models. And this to conservate oxygen during apneas and successive dives. And this topic was first published by Professor Duic from the Department of Integrative Physiology here in Split 20 years ago, where he found that spleen volume and blood flow response to repeated breathful dives in trained apnea divers, untrained person, and splectomized persons. And they, sh they actually show here on figure two that splectomized persons had no effects while these well-trained divers were able to hold their breaths for longer periods of time. So they saw that the blood ejected from the spleen increased the circulating red blood cell pool, putting the second and subsequent apneas into advantage over the first one because of the larger blood gas storage during apnea onset. So this was early work, and their next work actually showed, published in 2007 in the Journal of Applied Physiology, that spleen and cardiovascular function during apnea in divers that the spinal contraction is present immediately at apnea onset and is additionally accentuated by cold, cold forearm, forearm stimulation. And that more importantly, that the splenic capsule or the pulp rather than the blood vessels contract in response to sympathetic stimulation of the various organs. So this was the first paper actually to show an immediate response of the spleen during breathful diving. So the spleen contracted within the first three seconds. And the next work of a different group from Sweden actually showed that spleen size matters. So spleen lung and volume 
with larger screen, with subjects having larger screen, they were actually able to eject additional amount of red blood cells in the, in the systemic circulation to enhance oxygen storage and CO2 buffering capacity. These were, they, these were their claims back, in, back 10 years ago. And a most recent paper actually showed that eight weeks of static apnea training may increase splenic volume, but it doesn't actually do much for an active splenic contraction. So spleen training can increase the size, but it seems that this is insufficient to inflict significant adaptations of an acute response. So yes, your spleen gets larger, but there's no functional benefit from a larger spleen in, in this paper by Boone and his co-workers. A paper published in EJAB in 27, 15 years ago, showed that prolonged apnea training is in contrast with most recent findings recently presented, and that athletes in endurance sports apnea divers are not characterized with increased total oxygen hemoglobin mass, and no way, and this subsequently does not lead to a greater blood oxygen storage capacity. So there's an ongoing debate in the literature, and Bromer and his co-authors claim that the, the volume of uh, red blood cells ejected from the spleen is, is too low to actually make a substantial difference. So Swedish group actually moved to hypoxia research showing that splenic contraction in normal part hypoxia are actually increased at altitude and they increase the hypoxia tolerance. So candidates that the spleen contraction may be involved in the early hemoglobin increase is observed at high altitude especially. So the, they were looking for a link between splenic contraction and oxygen deprivation or hypoxia. So, so showing that if something does not happen at the city level, it doesn't do much for uh, hypoxic research. So the, the, the next, their next question was the effects of climbing Mount Everest, so that they did a lot of stuff on Mount Everest, and they showed that long-term uh, altitude exposure actually arguments and prolongs spleen contraction in response to active hypoxia challenges, with baseline spleen volumes remains unchanged. And this, according to their finding, was a efficient spleen contraction is beneficial in elevating red blood cell concentration during work at high altitude. So th this debate within the literature is basically sea level versus high altitude and the antigenic simulation of the spleen and its role in oxygen transport. So th their next move was that splenic contraction is enhanced at simulated high altitude exercise, and they showed that splenic contraction enhanced by hypoxia is further superimposed during exercise and reduced number in this stepwise manner, showing that tonic but partially con uh, contractions observed during these long term field ex expeditions at high altitude may be beneficial in conserving oxygen during this exposure to chronic hypoxia. So, th this is all hypoxia and spleen not in the lab, but under conditions of high altitude exposure. So the next question, a logical question, was splenic contraction exercise at sea level. And does splenic emptying argument aerobic performance? So Spelich and his co-authors actually tried to answer this question a couple of years ago, and they actually imaged the screen on several occasions showing that no benefits from splenic emptying to mean power output the level of hemoglobin, hematocrit, or oxygen saturation at the vastus lateralis muscle or oxygen uptake was observed in their study. So even though splenic emptying was excessive, no changes in performance variables at sea level was observed. So the next question was actually does one size fit all? Because even after this paper, who clearly showed that there are no effects on splenic emptying in oxygen transport at sea level, the Swedish group insisted that this actually fits all sizes. So, a series of letters to the editor in Asia were published this year suggesting that the increase in hemoglobin concentration improves oxygen uptake even after uh, some sort of uh, supplement consumption at sea level. 
And their most recent work was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, suggesting that enhanced clinic volume and contraction is characterized for uh, endurance elite athletes. So they had splenic volume measured in controlled and elite athletes to show that uh, a greater splenic emptying is something of uh, something typical for elite athletes, but not healthy active controls. And this is clearly seen on, on panels A and B, where uh, athletes had a greater magnitude of change in their splenic volume, and the, the amount of ejected hemoglobin was also greater, where controls had no change in hemoglobin. But this was static apneas prior to VO2 max testing. So this wasn't actually performed in parallel. They didn't do oxygen and spleen at the same time. They did one and the other minutes or hours after. And what is surprising in the study, what they, they showed uh, uh, some correlations between the splenic volume and the VO2 max with the oxygen uptake, by, but only for uh, athletes and not healthy individuals. And there was actually no correlation between splenic volume and maximal oxygen uptake. And they showed and suggest that even though biathletes or elite endurance athletes have a larger screen volume, this apnea induced contraction and elevated in hemoglobin is not something translated into a greater VO2 max. So they, they suggested a mechanism of some sort of uh, enhancement in oxygen carrying capacity, but we'll talk about it a bit, bit later on. So there are some methodological considerations when, when discussing splenic emptying and oxygen uptake. So the first one is that the oxygen uptake and the spleen were not measured simultaneously. And data on spleen volume changes were limited previously to pre and post exercise readings only. So there's no continuous image of the spleen until now. And what is shown from Dulich and his co-authors back in 2027 was that spleen contracts immediately at any kind of stimulus, especially after three seconds of breath hold. So the time frame needed for, for the spleen volume to fully recover is from 3 to 10 minutes. And therefore, once the spleen immediately contracts, it's rather tricky to estimate the spleen contractility and reactivity. And thereby, if you're not imaging spleen on a continuous basis, you, you, you can have uh, underestimated results and the red blood cell release and its influence on oxygen transport and performance. So, the, the next question was that the anatomical position of the spleen, of course, implies isolated views of the region of interest and likely overlaps with other visceral organs. So a clear image of the contracting spleen is difficult to obtain, especially during upright cycling exercise, for example, running especially. So to, to evade these kind of technical and methodological issues and to allow the probe of the ultrasound to be constantly positioned at the region of the instrument, at the instrument for the interest, we use the supine cycling model. So this actually permits each image to capture the size of the spleen at a given intensity domain. However, the supine cycling model is characterized with slower oxygen uptake kinetics, greater deoxygenization of vasopharynous muscle, and this is primarily due to the loss of hydrostatic pressure and the greater activation of type 2 bladders. So we actually use that for our preliminary work, where we measured simultaneously a lot of things. So, so we showed that splenic emptying does not correlate with faster oxygen kinetics, which is very close to the work showed by Stalich earlier. But what we did new here was that we measured cardiorespiratory, cardiovascular, and splenic response simultaneously. So we had baseline and we had uh, a protocol at 90% of gas exchange threshold with the well-known step transition model during supine rest, and we showed with correlation analysis that the splenic volume is not correlated with oxygen uptake. However, we showed that hematocrit and baseline is somewhat related to oxygen uptake, and we'll discuss that a bit later because this is an issue that we discussed with Dr. Poole at the latest experimental biology meeting. Where, we, where he had some interesting comments. So, so we showed our data for the first time at the, uh, this year's experimental biology meeting where we showed that spongy contraction to extent transition exercise is reduced, but the oxygen kinetics are not related because
is very closely constrained at the level of muscle. So the, the mechanism of oxygen transport is, is and its explanations are rather tricky. So we moved a set forth to publish an original article just recently, accepted it. Uh, the Journal of Applied Physiology, where we showed that it's not about the spleen, it's about the muscle. So everything important is at the level of the muscle, and I'll show this, this in detail. So this was our protocol. We did a square wave transition with spleen imaging, oxygen kinetics, spin up press, and ears in parallel. And we uh, were taking blood samples at baseline and the end of exercise. We did three step transition exercises. And we actually showed, here's a couple of pictures of our lab, so it's a custom-made uh, setup where we put an, uh, a bike 20, 25 centimeters above the level of the heart, and you can see on his right leg, we were using near infrared spectroscopy and press to measure cardiovascular demands, and we were able to capture oxygen uptake during this, and uh, somebody very proficient with the ultrasound probe did the ultrasound imaging, each minute during this step transition exercise. And what we saw is that regardless of your aerobic training background, so whether or not you're aerobically fit, your spleen empties at the same magnitude of, of change. So the, the magnitude of change is quite similar. And so is the hemoglobin and hematocrit increase. It's about 3 to 5 percent increase in hematocrit and hemoglobin following immediately after exercise cessation. And you can see the changes in near arterial pressure, cardiac output, and total peripheral resistance. So you can see a slight shift in cardiac output and near arterial pressure and peripheral and total peripheral resistance is actually decreasing. But the most interesting part of this research was uh, oxygen kinetics and deoxygenization kinetics. So at the level of the mouth, the kinetics profile were quite similar and there were no statistical differences between young healthy men of aerobically trained and untrained background. But at the level of the muscle, the change in the oxygenated hemoglobin with panel C is aerobically trained individuals and panel B is aerobically untrained individuals. You can clearly see the difference in the increase in the amplitude and the, the, the speed of the kinetics at the level of the muscle. And furthermore, to just confirm our previous reports, we actually showed that splenic volume and oxygen transport and kinetics are not closely related. So this actually suggests that it's all at the level of the muscle. And the, the role of O2 uptake kinetics is something of quite importance. And we showed that previously with our work looking at the, the speed of the muscle metabolism, so integration of the heart, lungs, and muscles all, all in one. And this was actually additionally confirmed by a recent paper from a better study of Professor Bruno Grassi, suggesting that, that in healthy individuals, first changes are at the level of the muscle. So peripheral environments of oxidative metabolism after 10 days of rest are upstream of mitochondrial respiration. So they did a, a bunch of stuff measuring from the level of the mouth to the level of the, the oxidative capacity of the mitochondria, but the first substantial change was observed in the microvascular circulation, suggesting that impairments in the microvascular circulation are consistent with physical inactivity. And the, the most recent review from the uh, Carlo Capelli and uh, Jose Cable group was that there's a substantial increase in the oxygen extraction fraction to maximum oxygen uptake in healthy young men. So again, at the level of the muscle, you can see on the panel C and F, the one leg exercise oxygen uptake and pulmonary oxygen uptake with very similar profiles, indicating that individuals of higher aerobic capacity are capable of greater oxygen extraction at the level of the muscle, regardless of the changes in orthostatic tolerance. So supine or upright positions. And this is very, very important in terms of exercise prescription and exercise optimization. So most recent, one of their work actually showed that the blood volume expansion does not explain increase in oxygen uptake. So this small amount of red blood cells expelled from the spleen actually do not enhance oxygen transport or VO2 max during uh, these kind of tests. And 
This is regarding oxygen transport pathways between pulmonary oxygen and uptake kinetics is not limited by oxygen delivery previously suggested by the Swedish group. So it's all at the level of the muscle and it's limited by the microvest the oxygen consumption at the level of the muscle. And Holstrom and Hinsko others didn't find any correlation between spinocampine and O2 uptake and this is the reason why. So the, the oxygen uptake is constrained at the level of the muscle. And this small and transient increase in circulating hemoglobin is rather insignificant and it's rather difficult to expect that this will substantially increase oxygen uptake during a step transition or a wave to max test. So the question remains whether or not oxygen supply versus oxygen utilization at periphery plays a, a substantial and important role. And most recent, not most recent, but a series of papers on the influence of plasma volume expansion on oxygen kinetics and irritopoietin treatment on pulmonary O2 all suggest that there are no effects, systemic effects of increased blood in the systemic circulation because this is constrained at the level of the muscle. So even if you perform a series of acute apneas, this, not, this does not improve your cycling performance as shown by Boom, and this is very close to work by Spellich and our most recent uh, short report and published in APNN. So this is quite clear that the mechanisms of oxygen transport that are reside at the level of the muscle. And one of the things that Golding and his group published is that determining the exercise intensity should be performed by the rate of oxygen uptake to boost exercise tolerance and mutate early fatigue development. So, so the oxygen kinetics actually determine exercise tolerance by mediating the power of output, not the other way around, which actually uh, resides the muscle metabolic uh, accumulation that exceeds the exercise critical threshold, as they call it. So, so it's quite important to highlight, to, to, <clears throat> to see the cause effect uh, in oxygen transport and how we can apply this into, uh, into exercise prescription and exercise tolerance. So, so the, the, the take home message from, from our work was that greater splenic emptying does not argument oxygen kinetics ir irrespective so of the splenic emptying and subsequent erythrocyte release. A positive correlation between baseline hematocrit and VO2 kinetics actually supports compelling weight of evidence that O2 delivery is not a constraint of VO2 kinetics in young healthy individuals and this is something that is widely shown by Dr. Poole and we discussed this with him at the late, most recent experimental biology meeting. Thus, despite a popular concept in the literature, splenic emptying on around 36% of the reduction in splenic volume does not correlate to O2 uptake during moderate intensity exercise or even maximum intensity exercise under standard laboratory conditions at sea level. So this is further supported by the fact that aerobically trained individuals are people of greater oxygen extraction, uh, greater O2 extraction fraction at the level of the last analysis, as reflected on the nearest variables, and this is compared to their aerobically untrained peers. And therefore, the O2 utilization during supine cycling is limited primarily by the skeletal muscle bioenergetics, while the splenic emptying does not affect apparently oxygen transport. This might be different at at high altitude and with superimposed by hypoxia, but at the level of the sea, apparently there are no changes and no effects on oxygen kinetics or maximal oxygen uptake uh, coming from the splenic emptying during this type of exercise. And thank you for your attention. And uh, my, my email address is given below, so you can reach out to me and contact me for any, any further details. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the only way you can get a clear image of the spleening on a minute-by-minute -minute basis
basis is using the supine model because when you will position the screen the ultrasound probe during the running or slightly looking upright, you can't get it actually, you, you can't get a clear picture because it's moving up and down and if the only way to get a clear image during exercise in the supine model. So this is not a realistic ecologically valid model, but this actually shows a mechanism. So you can you can get a minute by minute split imaging and you can have a, a person exercising at the same time and you can collect data on oxygen uptake during his uh, during his exercise bouts at the level of the muscle and the level of the lung. So you get an integrative response of the human during exercise. Hope this clarifies your question. Thank you very much. Very clear. Uh, Dr. Omar Hamoud, uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, Dr. Sofian. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Damir, for uh, this uh, excellent talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the determinant of uh, oxygen uptake and utilization during the uh, supine position. Uh, so, uh, if I uh, well understood, um, the increase of uh, blood volume or, of, or uh, plasma volume uh, did not um, correlate with the increase of uh, oxygen uptake during uh, exercise in the supine position. Um, so, uh, added to that, I, und I understood that uh, Spleen emptying uh, did not contribute to uh, explain this uh, phenomena. So, uh, what is the, the main uh, determinant, physiological determinant uh, of uh, endurance uh, performance uh, adaptation uh, when exercising in this uh, position? Thank you. Yes, it's, it's at the level of the muscle, it's the mitochondria. And it's, it's the microvascular circulation. So it's the O2 at the level of the muscle. O2 uptake at the level of the muscle, clearly explained by Dr. David Pools. So you've got a lot of research in that area. And biopsies and near supplication and combining both of those techniques actually suggest that it's all at the level of the muscle. So when, when, when you talk about the mitochondria, uh, uh, is there a difference in the in the pressure uh, out of the mitochondria and in, inside the mitochondria uh, in supine position uh, versus other position? Of course, you, you get a, a loss of hydrostatic pressure when you're exercising supine because your legs are higher above your heart for 25 or 30 centimeters and you, lo you, you lose an effect of gravity. So your venous return is actually affected. So yes, the effects of uh, gravity are substantial, but this is the only model where you can have a clear image of the spleen, so it's a compromise to in, in, promote internal validity. In terms of if you have, want to have a clear picture of the exercising spleen, you have to lose something if that's hydrostatic pressure. Uh, uh, last question, please. Uh, so, uh, concerning the if, uh, hypoxic and using factor. Uh, is there any difference when uh, we change uh, the position? Well, I, I didn't do any research in hypoxia personally. What I, what I read from the Swedish group and Professor Shagatai, they actually believe and show that the, the, the splenic emptying is further ahead. So I, I would love to check that, actually. And it's very difficult to, to organize such sort of studies at uh, actual Mount Everest or something like that. So, Maybe hypoxic chambers like those having Professor Mekamich at Manica are artificially stimulating hypoxia and lowering oxygen partial pressure would be the answer to your question. Yes, this would be very interesting. Combining exercise and hypoxia. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Sofian. Thank you for your questions.
qui va nous présenter des arguments scientifiques pour notre préparation physique chez, chez l'enfant. Monsieur Sébastien euh, Lassin. Bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien euh, Tout est bien. Bonjour euh, Monsieur Sébastien Lassin. Tout d'abord, merci euh, d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Alors, c'est avec plaisir. Est-ce que... Est-ce que j'ai est la main pour partager le, le PowerPoint euh, Oui, vous pouvez. Euh, là, on est en train de vous voir. Euh, vous, pouvez partager, oui. ouais, vous pouvez partager euh, votre, euh, votre écran. Et voilà. Parfait. Est-ce que vous le voyez tous euh, Oui, il manque le mot de plein écran. Euh, je vais ah. le Parce que de mon côté, je suis en mode plein écran. Euh, là, on n'a pas, pas le mode plein écran, euh, on a les diapos euh, à côté. Ah, alors, euh, juste pour comment cliquer, faire euh, Juste, non, sur euh, votre droite, encore. Alors, là, je suis en mode plein ouais, écran de mon côté. Là, voilà. Juste cliquer là-dessus. Oui, non. donc là, vous voyez en, en plein écran Non, on n'a pas. Ah, alors là, je suis désolé. Euh, comment bah, pas, euh, si, si vous avez déjà le mot de plein écran, euh, tant pis, on peut, on peut procéder comme ça. D'accord. Donc, euh, juste en tout cas, euh, oui. oui. Juste ah, un moment pour vous présenter au public. Donc, M. Sébastien Abatès est un enseignant-chercheur de l'Université Clermont-Auvergne en France. Donc, euh, il est spécialiste en physiologie de l'exercice musculaire, précisément des activités physiques chez euh, l'enfant et il va nous présenter des arguments scientifiques pour une préparation physique chez l'enfant. Donc la session euh, a pour une durée totale de 1 heure avec euh, 45 voire 50 minutes de présentation suivie par euh, une dizaine de minutes de questions. Merci euh, une autre fois et à vous la parole monsieur Sébastien. Bien mais merci, euh, merci pour la, la présentation et puis merci au aux organisateurs de, bah, du congrès international, euh, euh, c'est toujours un plaisir de, de pouvoir échanger, discuter, euh, notamment sur la thématique de l'enfant et, et, et l'entraînement et la préparation physique de cette population jeune. Euh, donc je vais, à travers ma présentation, vous présenter quelques arguments scientifiques euh, qui ont pour objectif euh, bah, de mieux accompagner euh, le jeune sportif euh, euh, notamment dans le domaine de, de la préparation physique et, et de l'entraînement, l'accompagner euh, dans un premier objectif, c'est de, de pouvoir optimiser la performance sur du, du long terme, euh, non pas sur du court terme, parce que ça serait faire fausse route, euh, que de préparer un jeune sportif sur, sur du court terme, il faut, euh, il faut envisager une préparation euh, sur, sur du long terme, puisque le jeune est en devenir et, et un futur adulte, donc... Euh, il faut euh, voir les choses sur du long terme et puis aussi euh, dans un objectif de prévenir le, le risque de, de blessure, notamment sur un organisme qui, euh, qui grandit, qui est encore immature et donc il faut éviter bien entendu de, de blesser euh, nos, jeunes, nos jeunes athlètes. Donc la problématique finalement c'est euh, la suivante, c'est la difficulté d'entraîner euh, des jeunes... Euh, des, des jeunes catégories, euh, de programmer, de bâtir sur un, un organisme qui est encore, euh, encore immature et en plein développement. Et vous avez ben, deux variables qui viennent se surajouter à celles qui régissent les, les principes de l'entraînement, ce sont la croissance et, et la maturation, je vais y venir. Euh, donc je vais essayer d'aborder les, les grands principes en fait, euh, qui sont à respecter dans la programmation euh, euh, de l'activité physique et sportive chez, chez l'enfant. Alors, euh, quand on parle de croissance, de quoi on parle euh, La croissance, elle se définit par l'augmentation progressive des dimensions du corps, euh, d'un organe ou d'un tissu. Donc, euh, ça traduit une augmentation quantitative euh, des, des, des dimensions. Donc, on parle souvent de, de taille, de bout, de taille assise, de poids, de circonférence, de diamètre. Donc, c'est un phénomène qui est facilement observable, quantifiable. Euh, puisque la taille et la taille assise peuvent se mesurer à l'aide d'une toise, le poids à l'aide d'une balance, euh, les circonférences ou les diamètres à partir d'un mètre ruban, etc. Donc ça c'est un phénomène quantitatif, facilement mesurable, observable, 
Et vous avez la maturation qui euh, se traduit euh, par la progression de la fonction euh, d'un organe ou d'un système biologique jusqu'à jusqu son état de maturité qui correspond au fonctionnement adulte. Euh, donc là, on est sur un phénomène plutôt qualitatif. Euh, là, on est sur, sur le, le fonctionnement d'un organe ou d'un tissu. Et la croissance et la maturation, en fait, ce sont deux phénomènes qui sont, qui sont complémentaires, mais qui peuvent euh, survenir de manière synchrone ou asynchrone dans le temps, mais en tout cas qui, euh, qui constitue le développement euh, de, de l'enfant. Alors dans le développement, il n'y a, a pas que la croissance et la maturation, on peut ajouter aussi le vieillissement euh, au sens large. En tout cas, moi je m'attarderai sur euh, ces deux phénomènes de croissance et de maturation. Alors, si on prend un exemple très simple, hein, le muscle, lorsqu'il grandit, il est sous l'action euh, des hormones anthropogènes, notamment de la testostérone chez, chez le garçon, des, des oestrogènes. Oui Excusez-moi. En fait, on, euh, oui. on dit toujours que la première diapositive, car là, on a, euh, on a toujours la première diapositive. Et je ne pense pas... Euh, ah non Voilà, maintenant, euh, voilà. Donc là, on est en train de suivre. Ah, donc là, ok. Donc ah, c'est resté comme ça. Excusez-moi, c'est pas changé. Là, vous êtes bien sur la diapositive numéro 3 Là, oui, mais avant, non. Okay. D'accord, très bien, mais vous faites une logique. Oui, d'accord. D'accord, merci. Euh, oui, donc pour illustrer un petit peu ces effets de la croissance et de la maturation, euh, on peut prendre le muscle squelettique et le muscle effecteur du, du mouvement. Alors le muscle, lorsqu'il grandit, lorsqu'il subit la croissance, il, il grandit, il grossit, il prend de la masse, du volume, et là, il est sous l'action des hormones androgènes, notamment la testostérone chez le garçon et puis les oestrogènes chez, euh, chez les filles en particulier. Et donc euh, le muscle grandit, prend du volume, prend de la masse et donc il est dépendant de la maturation du système hormonal. Euh, vous voyez ici à l'écran, par exemple, vous avez les fameuses courbes de Scammon euh, qui datent des années 70, où là vous voyez au fil, au fil du temps, au, au fil de l'âge, euh, on a une... une une maturation du système hormonal en vert, cette maturation a lieu essentiellement aux alentours de 12-14 ans, notamment 12 ans chez la fille, 14 ans chez le garçon, et sous l'action du système hormonal, par maturation de ce système-là, vous avez euh, bah, une hypertrophie du muscle, une augmentation de, de sa masse et de son volume. Donc là, on a vraiment une croissance qui est, euh, qui est influencée par la maturation hormonale. Mais euh, ça ne veut pas dire que le muscle fonctionne mieux que le muscle fonctionne bien, qu'il puisse produire de la force, il faut qu'il soit, qu qu soit activé par, par le système nerveux central. Et il faut absolument une maturation du système nerveux central pour que le muscle puisse fonctionner, et puisse être recruté et mobilisé. Euh, puisque le muscle va pouvoir fonctionner euh, si le système nerveux central euh, l'active, s'il recrute euh, et active les unités motrices, les fibres musculaires qui sont énervées. Et c'est ce recrutement et cette synchronisation des fibres musculaires innervées ou des unités motrices, euh, son recrutement, en fait, il est, il est dépendant de la maturation euh, du système nerveux. Et cette maturation nerveuse, en fait, comme vous le voyez ici en rouge, euh, à travers cette figure, vous voyez que le système nerveux central, il mature essentiellement, vous voyez, sur les premières années de la vie, jusqu'à l'âge de 14-15 ans, et puis continue à maturer jusqu'à l'âge de 25 ans. Et donc cette maturation nerveuse, elle est vraiment essentielle pour que le muscle puisse être mobilisé, être recruté, et pour que le muscle puisse produire de la force et de la puissance. Donc vous voyez bien le lien entre cette maturation nerveuse, cette maturation hormonale, cette croissance et euh, le fonctionnement de, 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 ce tissu, de ce tissu musculaire. Alors nous, au laboratoire à Clermont-Ferrand, euh, en Auvergne, on, on, on mesure depuis très longtemps ces niveaux d'activation volontaire. Euh, à travers la technique de la secousse surimposée, la Twitch Interpolation Technique. Et donc, on, on a évalué, euh, notamment chez des enfants prépubères, des niveaux d'activation euh, qui sont de l'ordre de 80% à peu près. C'est-à-dire que les enfants prépubères ont un déficit nerveux de 20%. Alors que euh, chez les adultes, euh, en moyenne, euh, le niveau d'activation volontaire est aux alentours de 95%. C'est-à-dire qu'un adulte lambda qui ne s'entraîne pas forcément en force, à un déficit nerveux de 5%, d'environ 5%. Si vous faites la différence entre le niveau d'activation volontaire des enfants prépubères et des adultes, vous avez une différence de l'ordre de 15%. De 15%. Et 
Et cette maturation nerveuse qui a lieu vraiment essentiellement durant les premières années de la vie, voilà, elle, est, elle est essentielle dans le recrutement et dans la capacité du muscle à produire sa force et sa puissance. Alors, c'est tout le principe de, de l'entraînement de la force avant la puberté. Il y a à peu près une trentaine ou une quarantaine d'années, on considérait que l'entraînement de la force était inutile chez les enfants. Mais euh, aujourd'hui, euh, en tout cas, les, les sociétés savantes, les, les, euh, les sociétés de médecine euh, du sport ou de, de physiologie de l'exercice préconisent vraiment de, de faire de la force, euh, même chez les enfants tépubères, pour réduire ce déficit nerveux et améliorer la capacité du système nerveux central à recruter et à mieux mobiliser ces fameuses unités motrices. Donc on peut très bien augmenter le niveau de force avant la puberté sans hypertrophier le muscle parce que l'enfant le, prépubère n'a pas le matériel hormonal pour hypertrophier. Mais en tout cas, on peut très bien augmenter le niveau de force en réduisant le, le déficit nerveux euh, et en, en améliorant cette capacité de recrutement et d'activation des unités motrices. C'est tout à fait possible, les études le montrent euh, euh, notamment à travers la littérature scientifique. Alors, euh, ce qui caractérise la croissance et la maturation, c'est euh, bah, des vitesses de croissance, euh, de la taille ici à gauche et puis euh, de la masse ici à droite. Vous avez des vitesses de croissance qui, euh, qui ne sont pas linéaires dans le temps. C'est-à-dire que si on, on regarde la figure de gauche, là vous avez la vitesse de croissance de la taille en centimètres par an, exprimée en fonction de l'âge, vous voyez, entre 6 et, et l'âge de 22 ans. En rouge, vous avez euh, les filles et en bleu, vous avez les garçons. Et ce que l'on peut observer c'est qu'on a euh, un pic euh, de vélocité de croissance de la taille qui a lieu aux alentours de 12 ans chez la fille, 14 ans chez le garçon. Et vous avez déjà, vous voyez, euh, une différence d'environ 2 ans entre la fille et le garçon sur ce pic de croissance rapide de la taille. Donc vous avez un timing qui diffère en fonction du sexe. Et au-delà de ce timing, vous avez aussi un, un pic, un pic euh, qui est aux alentours, dans cette figure-là, de 7 cm par an. Mais en tout cas, on peut avoir des pics euh, de, de vélocité de croissance de la taille qui soient compris entre 10 et 12 cm. Donc, ça veut dire qu'il y, y a des enfants qui peuvent grandir très très vite en, en peu de temps. Euh, la fille... Et à côté de vous avez le gain de masse, c'est-à-dire la vitesse de croissance de, de, de la masse corporelle en kilogrammes par an, ou également vous avez un timing qui diffère en fonction du, du sexe, hein, la fille aux alentours de 12 ans, le garçon aux alentours de 15 ans et demi, 16 ans, donc vous avez un écart lié, lié au sexe, et vous avez aussi une amplitude avec, euh, vous voyez, un pic aux alentours de 6 kg par an pour, pour la fille, et un pic aux alentours de 7 kg par an pour le garçon. Alors ce qui est intéressant de retenir dans dans ces, deux, dans ces deux illustrations, c'est que euh, les filles vont, euh, vont avoir un pic de croissance rapide de la taille qui va correspondre à celui de la masse, c'est-à-dire que la fille va grandir et en même temps elle va, elle va prendre de la masse, et notamment de la masse grasse, euh, puisque les oestrogènes vont, euh, vont euh, produire euh, ben, cette, cette fameuse masse grasse qui peut être euh, un point handicapant pour la fille, qui est une masse inerte et qui, euh, qui ne sert pas à grand chose finalement et qui, qui peut être aussi détriment au détriment finalement de, des capacités euh, fonctionnelles de, euh, de déplacement pour, pour la fille. Euh, chez le garçon, c'est un peu différent parce que le garçon lui prend, euh, prend de la taille, vous voyez, à 14 ans, euh, et par contre, il va prendre de la masse eh bien, un an et demi, voire deux ans après, après la taille. Ça veut dire que vous avez des garçons qui peuvent grandir très très vite, qui peuvent s'allonger très vite, euh, qui peuvent être assez, assez, euh, assez frêles, hein, assez, assez fins, mais qui, euh, qui vont prendre de la masse euh, seulement un an et demi, voire deux ans après euh, la taille. Donc on a souvent, entre 14 ans et 16 ans, des garçons qui grandissent vite et qui prennent de la masse un petit peu plus tardivement. Alors, euh, vous avez euh, autour de ces pics-là ben, des périodes de maladresse des, 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 des enfants, parce que euh, les enfants... Euh, euh, ont un schéma corporel qui se modifie, des repères spatio-temporels qui se modifient également. Donc vous avez souvent une période de maladresse aux alentours, autour des 12 ans chez la fille et des 14 ans chez le garçon. Donc il va falloir faire très attention à, à, à retravailler un petit peu la motricité, euh, la technique, de manière à pouvoir euh, voilà, réajuster peut-être des, euh, des, euh, euh, des problèmes de motricité euh, voilà, qui, euh, qui peuvent se passer euh, autour de ces, de ces deux pics. Après, euh, ce décalage entre la taille et entre la masse, en fait, 
ça a un problème chez le garçon parce que lorsque vous avez un garçon qui grandit vite, et notamment qui grandit beaucoup euh, au niveau de la colonne vertébrale, si la colonne vertébrale n'est pas musclée, n'est pas bien gainée ou bien renforcée musculairement, cette colonne vertébrale elle peut se déformer et on peut avoir des problèmes de, de dos, hein, des scolioses, des lordoses. Donc vous avez tout intérêt à, à, à faire une bonne préparation physique, vous voyez, entre 14 ans et, et 16 ans chez le garçon, de manière à bien protéger la colonne vertébrale, vertébrale à bien la gainer et à éviter euh, voilà, des déformations euh, du dos telles que des, des scolioses ou des lordoses. Donc, euh, la préparation physique, l'entraînement de la force a toute son importance, vous voyez, chez les garçons, notamment entre 14, 14 ans et 16 ans. Euh, alors, ce qui est intéressant finalement, c'est d'essayer d'estimer ce fameux pic de vélocité de croissance de la taille. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, il faut éviter de considérer uniquement l'âge chronologique, c'est-à-dire l'âge qui est basé sur la date de naissance. Aujourd'hui, les catégories d'âge telles qu'elles sont euh, organisées, notamment en France, ce sont des catégories d'âge de 2 ans. On a des poussins, des minimes, des, des, euh, des benjamins, des cadets, etc., des juniors, mais c'est des catégories de 2 ans qui sont basé uniquement sur l'âge chronologique. Euh, et comme, euh, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure, on peut avoir un écart de maturation entre, entre des enfants qui, euh, qui ont le même âge chronologique. C'est-à-dire on peut prendre deux enfants qui ont la même date de naissance, qui sont nés la même année, mais qui peuvent avoir une maturation complètement différente entre, entre eux. Et avoir un pic de vélocité de croissance qui est décalé peut-être de 4 à 5 ans entre, entre les enfants euh, de même âge chronologique. Donc ça veut dire qu'il ne faut pas uniquement considérer l'âge chronologique, mais il faut essayer aussi d'estimer l'âge biologique qui va correspondre, qui va être finalement associé à ce pic de vélocité de croissance de, de la taille. Parce que la fille, par exemple, elle a un PVC de la taille à 12 ans, mais elle a ses premières règles. Vous voyez, dans les 3-4 mois qui suivent le PVC de, de la taille, on a une maturation sexuelle chez la fille qui est... Euh, au-delà un petit peu des 12 ans, c'est-à-dire sur les mois qui suivent un petit peu les 12 ans. Mais ça, c'est pas un moyen, on peut avoir des décalages de pic assez importants entre, dans, entre des enfants qui ont le même âge, que, qui ont le même âge chronologique. Donc, il faut absolument considérer cet âge qui va correspondre au PVC de la taille dans le suivi d'accompagnement des jeunes sportifs au cours de leur, de leur développement. Alors, vous avez... Euh, une possibilité, c'est de faire des mesures régulières de, de la taille tous les trois mois, par exemple, et puis essayer euh, vous-même, si vous voulez, de, 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 de constituer ces fameux cours de vitesse de croissance de la taille. Si vous faites des mesures régulières tous les trois mois, ben vous saurez à quel moment, finalement, l'enfant se situe. Est-ce qu'il est plutôt dans la phase descendante de sa courbe Est-ce qu'il est plutôt dans sa phase ascendante Est-ce qu'il est aux alentours du pic Est-ce qu'il est, qu est euh, sur la phase descendante ici donc vous voyez, si vous faites des mesures de taille irrégulière ou des mesures de poids réguliers, vous pourrez à peu près estimer à quel moment se situe le pic de vélocité de croissance. Et ça, c'est important dans, dans l'accompagnement et le suivi des, des, jeunes, des jeunes sportifs. Après, si vous ne faites pas des mesures régulières de la taille ou de la masse, vous avez des équations de prédiction euh, de cet âge au, au PVC de la taille. Euh, je vous les présenterai tout à l'heure. En tout cas, ces équations de prédiction, elles sont spécifiques au sexe. Et elles, elles permettent à partir d'une mesure de taille de cou, de taille assise et de poids euh, d'estimer cet âge euh, correspondant au PVC. Et ça, c'est un outil. Il y a des logiciels qui existent aujourd'hui. Ce sont des outils d'accompagnement qui sont de plus en plus utilisés dans les pays anglo-saxons, notamment en Angleterre ou en Australie, et qui vous permettent de prédire l'âge de ce PVC et donc d'estimer l'âge biologique des, euh, des enfants. Donc, euh, alors pourquoi euh, quel est l'intérêt finalement d'évaluer ce, ce PVC euh, euh, Alors, il y a plusieurs raisons. En fait. L'entraîneur ou le préparateur physique il doit prendre en compte la maturation de l'enfant afin tout d'abord de considérer euh, que les gains rapides de performance au moment du PVC, ils ne sont pas ou peu liés à l'entraînement proposé. Parce que lorsque vous suivez une cohorte d'enfants, des jeunes sportifs, les enfants vont subir la croissance, ils vont grandir et puis aussi... Euh, en pratiquant, euh, en faisant, euh, en s'entraînant régulièrement, euh, il y a aussi les effets d'entraînement qui viennent se surajouter. Ah, ça, sur... Donc en fait, il faut savoir euh, de ce qui relève de l'effet de la croissance et de ce qui relève de l'effet d'entraînement. Donc c'est pour ça qu'il faut essayer euh, de constituer ces vitesses de croissance de la taille et du poids de manière à savoir ce qui euh, 
relève de la croissance, de ce qui relève de l'entraînement. Ça, c'est un, un premier point important. Euh, le deuxième point important, c'est d'analyser plus justement les performances entre deux enfants de même âge chronologique. Euh, vous avez ici un écran, euh, on retrouve ces fameuses courbes de vitesse de croissance de, de la taille, donc ici c'est chez, chez un garçon, et vous avez euh, ici en moyenne, vous voyez, vous avez un pic avec euh, une moyenne, un écart type, et vous avez à 14 ans ici, euh, voilà, un, un pic euh, chez le garçon, et vous avez euh, en noir un cas particulier c'est-à-dire un enfant que l'on a suivi. Et vous voyez, au lieu d'avoir un pic de croissance rapide de sa taille à 14 ans, il l'a aux alentours de, de, de 11 ans. C'est-à-dire que là, on a affaire à un enfant qui, est, euh, qui mature plus précocement que les autres. Il a un PVC de sa taille à 11 ans, alors qu'il aurait dû l'avoir à 4. En moyenne, c'est 14 ans. Donc, en fait, on a un, cas un, un enfant qui, qui mature plus tôt, plus précocement. Et donc, euh, et ça, c'est... Ces, euh, ces cas particuliers euh, sont à, à prendre en compte parce que euh, lorsqu'on a affaire à des enfants qui maturent plus tôt, ben, ce sont des enfants qui physiquement euh, grandissent plus tôt, qui euh, intellectuellement ou psychologiquement aussi maturent plus, plus tôt. Et donc on a des enfants qui peuvent performer euh, plus tôt et, et être bien meilleurs que les autres. Et la dérive ou le biais de, de, de cela, c'est que euh, dans le milieu d'entraînement, on s'attarde, euh, en tout cas, on, on, on suit beaucoup plus ces jeunes-là par défaut parce qu'ils sont plus performants plus tôt et on a tendance à délaisser en quelque sorte les autres, les autres enfants qui maturent plus tardivement. Il faut faire attention à ces problèmes de décalage et de maturation qui peuvent créer un véritable biais dans les, dans les sélections, notamment dans les centres de formation, dans, dans les académies de foot ou, ou bien dans des, dans, des pôles, dans des pôles espoir, dans des pôles, nous en France, on a des pôles France. Donc on a tendance aussi à, à, à ne s'attarder que sur ces cas de maturité précoce. Ils peuvent être très bons très tôt, mais ensuite devenir euh, plus faibles plus tard et se faire attraper par d'autres qui vont maturer plus, plus tardivement. Donc attention à, à ces décalages de maturation biologique. Euh, Au-delà au de, de l'âge biologique, vous avez aussi l'âge relatif, c'est-à-dire que vous avez des enfants sur une même année civile sur une même année calendaire, vous avez des enfants qui sont nés en début d'année, qui naissent en début d'année, et puis des enfants qui naissent en fin d'année. Et là, ici, vous avez euh, bah, l'exemple d'un jeune qui est né le 1er janvier de l'année, vous avez ici à droite, et vous avez un jeune ici à gauche qui est né plutôt en fin d'année, le 31, le 31 décembre. Donc, ils sont de la même année, sauf qu'ils ont quasiment, ils ont un an d'écart. Entre le 1er janvier et le 31 décembre, ils ont un an d'écart, et un an d'écart, c'est considérable, surtout sur des jeunes catégories, c'est-à-dire jusqu'à l'âge de 9 ans. Euh, cet, cet effet en fait, de l'âge relatif qu'on appelle, il est très important jusqu'à l'âge de 9 ans. C'est-à-dire un an, c'est considérable euh, avant l'âge de 9 ans. Donc ça, c'est aussi à prendre en compte dans tout, dans tout suivi accompagnement des jeunes. Euh, vous ne pouvez pas euh, tenir compte uniquement de l'âge chronologique, uniquement de l'âge biologique. Il faut aussi, aussi tenir compte de l'âge relatif et de la date de naissance. Euh, vous pouvez très bien avoir des, des jumeaux, par exemple, qui naissent, euh, un qui naît le 31 décembre à 23h55 et un autre qui naît le 1er janvier à minuit 15, il aura 20 minutes de, de, de l'écart, sauf qu'ils seront dans des catégories d'âge différentes. Euh, donc il faut faire attention à, à, à ces problèmes d'âge relatif. Euh, la dérive, c'est la suivante, c'est-à-dire que lorsque vous avez affaire à des enfants qui ont un âge relatif élevé, c'est-à-dire qu'ils sont nés en début d'année, ben, ils se retrouvent beaucoup plus développés, ils produisent de meilleures performances, ils sont sélectionnés voilà, dans, des centres, dans des centres régionaux ou des centres de formation par exemple, et bien entendu, ils, me, ils bénéficient de meilleures mesures d'encouragement, des feedbacks positifs, et c'est un cercle plutôt positif pour eux. Donc, en fait, euh, c'est que du bonus pour eux. Par contre, ceux qui sont nés en fin d'année, qui ont un âge relatif bas, ils sont moins développés, ils produisent de moins bonnes performances, ils ne sont pas sélectionnés. Soit ils abandonnent l'activité, soit ils bénéficient de peu de mesures d'encouragement particulières, et c'est plutôt un cercle négatif. Donc attention aussi à ces conséquences de l'effet de l'âge relatif dans l'accompagnement des jeunes. Et aujourd'hui, dans les sélections, on s'aperçoit qu'il y a plus de 80% des jeunes qui sont sélectionnés, qui sont nés en début d'année, notamment entre le mois de janvier et le mois d'avril. Donc faites attention, moi, mon, mon, un des messages clés à vous faire passer aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment 
il ne faut pas tenir compte uniquement de l'âge chronologique, mais il faut aussi tenir compte de l'âge relatif qui a un poids considérable jusqu'à l'âge de 9-10 ans, et ensuite de l'âge biologique, euh, vous voyez, entre l'âge de 9 ans et, et, et 17-18 ans. En fait, il y a trois âges à retenir dans l'accompagnement et le suivi des, des jeunes. Ensuite, le troisième argument, euh, notamment d'évaluer le, le, le pic de vélocité de croissance de la taille, c'est euh, de mieux quantifier la charge d'entraînement et la charge de travail au moment du, du pic de vélocité de croissance. Parce qu'autour de ce pic de vélocité de croissance, c'est une, une, une période sensible de, de blessure. Alors je m'explique. Ici à l'écran, vous avez euh, bah, les vitesses de, de croissance de la taille en centimètres par an. Donc on retrouve ici la taille en bleu foncé. Alors là, c'est chez la fille. On a un PVC de la taille aux alentours de 12 ans, ici. Mais si on décompose un petit peu les vitesses de croissance des différentes parties du corps, ici en rouge, vous avez la vitesse, la vitesse de croissance des membres inférieurs, ici. Et ici en, 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 en bleu, en bleu ciel, enfin en bleu plutôt gris, mais grisé, vous avez euh, le pic de vélocité de croissance du, du tronc. Donc ça veut dire que les enfants, quand ils grandissent, ils grandissent d'abord par les membres inférieurs ici, et ensuite par le tronc. Et vous avez que le PVC de la taille, ici, il est compris entre le PVC des membres inférieurs et le PVC euh, du tronc. Euh, alors, ça, ça a des conséquences parce que, comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, autour du PVC de la taille, vous avez un schéma corporel qui est modifié, c'est-à-dire avec des enfants qui grandissent d'abord par les jambes et ensuite par le tronc. Vous avez un schéma corporel qui est modifié, des repères spatio-temporels qui sont modifiés. Donc ici, où, euh, vous avez tout un intérêt, finalement, à à maintenir ou à travailler les qualités motrices hein, de coordination, d'adresse, d'agilité, d'équilibre, de manière finalement à, à, à bien euh, maintenir ou entretenir la motricité. Bien sûr, vous aurez travaillé avant euh, le PVC de la taille, c'est-à-dire durant la maturation du système nerveux central, euh, c'est une période favorable et, et, et importante pour développer la motricité et les habiletés motrices. Mais ces habiletés motrices, il faut les entretenir autour de ce PVC de la taille parce que le schéma corporel est complètement modifié. Alors, au-delà de, euh, de ces aspects euh, de qualité motrice, voilà, je vous disais que c'était une période de blessure assez importante. Pourquoi Parce que lorsque vous avez des membres inférieurs qui grandissent vite en peu de temps, euh, notamment à ce moment-là, vous, euh, vous avez en fait bah, des leviers osseux qui vont, qui vont s'allonger, c'est-à-dire des, des, des longueurs osseuses qui vont vraiment euh, s'allonger, qui, qui vont augmenter. Et en même temps, vous avez le système musculo-tendineux qui va se mettre en tension. C'est comme un arc, en fait. Hein. Vous avez un arc, euh, la, si vous allongez euh, euh, le, manche, le manche de l'arc, ben, la corde, en fait, va, va se mettre en, en tension. Ben, C'est la même chose avec le, ben, les membres inférieurs. Si vous avez vraiment des leviers osseux qui s'allongent, vous avez en parallèle, le système musculo-tendineux qui se met en tension. Et l'os, euh, l'os, c'est pas encore de l'os qui, euh, qui est mature qui, et qui est, qui est solide. L'os, c'est du cartilage. C'est comme du plat qui est friable. Si vous tirez sur du plat, il se, il se, il se fissure. Euh, et là, c'est ce que vous avez en fait. L'os, c'est du cartilage. Les tendons, ou les tendons tirent de trop sur, euh, sur les os, en tout cas au niveau des points d'attache. Et vous avez l'os qui peut se fissurer, et c'est ce qu'on appelle des pathologies de croissance, c'est ce qu'on appelle des ostéochondroses. Vous avez par exemple au niveau du tendon rotulien, le tendon rotulien vient s'insérer sur la tuberosité tibiale ici. Et si le tendon rotulien tire de trop sur cette tuberosité, vous avez euh, probablement une fragmentation de l'os, et donc une fissure de l'os. Et donc c'est ce qu'on appelle la fameuse maladie d'Oswood de Schlatter. Euh, vous avez euh, des points de douleur, notamment chez les enfants qui grandissent vite parce que tout se met en tension. Et vous avez la même chose au niveau du calcanéum, c'est-à-dire que le tendon d'Achille, le tendon, euh, le tendon d'Achille, en fait, s'il tire trop sur, euh, sur le calcanéum, vous avez un calcanéum qui peut se fissurer. Et donc là, vous avez une autre osteochondrose qu'on appelle la maladie de Sever. Ici, euh, vous avez une fragmentation de l'os. Euh, de l'os à ce niveau-là, et donc ça peut être aussi très problématique pour les enfants qui s'entraînent. Donc, ici, je reviens sur cette diapositive, au moment où les membres inférieurs s'allongent rapidement, euh, vous pouvez avoir euh, une survenue, en tout cas, des pathologies de croissance relativement importantes euh, chez les enfants, ici, au niveau euh, du genou et au niveau euh, du talon. Voilà. 
Alors, il faut éviter, euh, il faut éviter euh, des activités avec trop d'impact mécanique. Et ce que je vous conseille, finalement, c'est très l'activité euh, plutôt à, à trois portées, c'est-à-dire des activités de pédalage, de natation, ou, euh, ou se mettre sur un, un ergomètre euh, euh, aviron, hein, un rameur, par exemple, voilà, où on réduit, en quelque sorte, ces impacts, euh, ces impacts mécaniques. Voilà, parce que, en plus... En plus de la croissance, si vous intensifiez la charge de travail, à ce moment-là, vous risquez d'amplifier ces ostéochondroses et ces pathologies de croissance. Donc il faut essayer de réduire le volume et la quantité de travail, mais plutôt de travailler la qualité, de travailler en qualité, pour éviter euh, d'amplifier ces, ces fameuses ostéochondroses. Alors après, euh, on peut très bien proposer des activités euh, de type croisé, c'est-à-dire comme euh, nous chez nous, on a le triathlon, et on a le, le duathlon ou l'aquathlon. La L'aquathlon, c'est natation, euh, natation euh, course à pied. On a le duathlon, ben c'est euh, course à pied, euh, cyclisme. Euh, le triathlon, ben c'est natation, cyclisme, course à pied. Donc chaque, à chaque fois, vous avez euh, des activités à poids porté et non porté. Et le fait de croiser finalement des activités à poids porté et non porté, en quelque sorte, vous pouvez euh, développer le système aérobie, donc l'endurance des enfants tout en préservant ben, la charpente osseuse qui est encore immature et fragile euh, au, niveau, au niveau osseux. Euh, et puis après, il y a tout le matériel sportif aussi, attention à la aux chaussures, attention aussi à, à la qualité des appuis, à la technique de course, etc., qui peuvent aussi impacter euh, la survenue de ces pathologies de croissance. Voilà, ici vous avez euh, des belles radiographies euh, au, niveau, ben, au niveau du genou, là vous avez une belle ostéochondrose, hein, une belle, belle fissure de de, de l'os au niveau de la tuberosité tibiale, donc une maladie d'os gauche de la terre. Et là, ici, vous avez une belle fissure au niveau du, du calcanium, où là, on a une belle fragmentation qui vous illustre une maladie de sel. Voilà, donc en fait, pour illustrer euh, un peu plus les propos, euh, ce qui se passe chez les enfants, ben, ce sont surtout des, surtout des problèmes au niveau de l'os, avec un arrachement au niveau de l'os. Euh, au niveau tendineux, il y a, avant la puberté, il y a quasiment peu de problèmes puisque le tendon est relativement compliant chez l'enfant, c'est-à-dire que le tendon, lui, il est relativement flexible, il, euh, il démontre une bonne capacité de distension, donc il y a peu de tendinite chez les enfants prépubères, alors que chez les adultes, eh l'os, il y a moins de, moins de problèmes, c'est plus au niveau tendineux. Voilà, donc en fait, quand vous développez, quand vous accompagnez un jeune aussi, faire attention aussi à cette, à cette charpente osseuse qui, euh, qui est encore fragilisée. Et si on regarde la littérature scientifique, euh, euh, le nombre de jours manqués à l'entraînement, notamment dans le milieu du football, ce sont des jeunes footballeurs de 12 ans qui, pratiquaient, qui pratiquent tous les jours, vous voyez que le taux d'absentéisme à l'entraînement, le nombre de jours manqués à l'entraînement, il est plus important pendant le pic de vélocité de croissance qu'avant ou après le pic de croissance. Vous voyez donc là, euh, généralement, à l'entraînement, on est trop gourmand en tant qu'entraîneur ou préparateur physique, on souhaite augmenter le volume d'entraînement à la chambre de travail, ben, sauf qu'on blesse nos, nos jeunes et donc on, on les amène à arrêter leur activité parce qu'ils ils se, ben, se retrouvent inaptes à, à, à pouvoir faire quoi que ce soit parce qu'ils ont des ostéochondroses ou des blessures. Donc il faut travailler plus en qualité et moins en quantité autour du PVC. Ça aussi c'est un message fort, il faut réduire l'intensité d'entraînement autour du pic de croissance rapide. Le contrôle moteur général, le diagnostic. Alors, ensuite, euh, euh, le dernier point, en fait, c'est de pouvoir euh, proposer des contenus d'entraînement plus adaptés, c'est-à-dire essayer de mieux structurer mais, le travail des qualités physiques, oui. de la souplesse, oui. l'endurance ou la force, à, en fonction du, du PVC. Alors, par exemple, si, euh, si on parle de la souplesse, euh, la souplesse, euh, elle est importante à, à entretenir chez les jeunes, notamment autour du PVC, parce que lorsqu'un jeune grandit vite, qui, qui prend de la masse musculaire, euh, ben le système musculo-tendineux, il, il devient beaucoup plus raide. Et donc, lorsque l'enfant grandit, qui prend de la masse musculaire, tout le système devient plus raide. Et donc, donc, il va falloir entretenir la souplesse, qui est relativement bonne avant le PVC, mais qui diminue pendant le PVC. Donc, vous avez tout intérêt à proposer des assouplissements, des exercices d'étirement, notamment pendant et après, après le PVC. Alors avant le PVC, c'est important parce qu'il faut quand même éduquer nos jeunes à bien s'étirer, euh, faire ça en petits groupes, il faut que les jeunes apprennent à, à bien se placer, à bien se positionner, éviter les étirements par à coup, etc. En tout cas, 
c'est beaucoup plus éducatif qu'autre chose. Et après, au moment du PVC et après le PVC, ben, les exercices d'assouplissement sont importants justement pour réduire ces raideurs et garantir une certaine souplesse. Et bien sûr, éviter les, les blessures à, à, au, cours, au cours de l'exercice physique. Alors, ce qui se passe généralement lorsqu'on renforce les quadriceps, ici, vous avez une illustration à droite, les quadriceps, eux, ben, ils s'épaississent, ils s'élargissent, mais ils se raccourcissent. Et les quadriceps, je vous rappelle que c'est quatre chefs, vous avez trois vastes qui sont monoarticulaires qui croissent sur le genou, euh, qui n'agissent que sur le genou, mais vous avez un muscle qui est biarticulaire, qui, euh, qui croise la hanche et le genou, c'est le droit fémoral, qui est le droit antérieur. Et le droit fémoral, en fait, il vient s'insérer au niveau de l'épidémiaque antéro-supérieur ici. Et lorsque le droit fémoral se renforce, il se, il se raccourcit, mais il s'élargit, le droit fémoral, il tire sur les pignacs antéros supérieurs, il fait basculer le bassin vers l'avant et vers le bas. Vous avez le bateau du sacrum qui s'incline vers le bas. Et vous avez euh, mécaniquement, vous voyez, une, euh, bah, une hyperlordose secondaire qui va, qui va se former. Donc lorsque vous avez un muscle qui, euh, quadriceps qui se renforce, qui se raccourcit, vous avez, via le droit fémoral, un basculement euh, de la hanche du bassin vers, vers l'avant et vers le bas, et donc une hyperlordose lombaire. Quand vous avez une hyperlordose lombaire, c'est pas bon parce que vous avez les disques intervertébraux qui se compriment, qui se cisaillent, et vous avez à la longue euh, euh, des, des lombalgies euh, qui, euh, qui, qui apparaissent, donc des douleurs, des douleurs dorsales. Donc quand un enfant, bon, c'est pas trop critique parce qu'un enfant il est, il, est encore, il est encore frais, il est encore tout, tout jeune, mais à la longue, lorsque l'enfant va grandir, qu'il va devenir adolescent et puis adulte et ainsi de suite, ben, ces douleurs qui sont euh, silencieuses au départ, elles peuvent devenir. Euh, euh, ben, peuvent se déclarer et devenir importantes euh, au, moment, au moment où l'enfant grandit. Donc attention, il faut éviter euh, ben, cette antéversion du bassin, il faut une rétroversion du bassin de manière à pouvoir euh, euh, éviter l'hyperlordose et donc la survenue des lombalgies, euh, des lombalgies chroniques. Donc ça nécessite de bien s'étirer, de bien étirer le quadriceps, notamment le droit fémoral ici, et en plus en étirant les quadriceps, vous évitez euh, une mise en tension des ischios jambiers qui sont les antagonistes et donc euh, évitez aussi les blessures au niveau des, des ischios jambiers qui sont des, des muscles très, très sensibles aux, aux blessures. Donc ça nécessite des, des programmes d'étirement d'assouplissement au moment du PVC et après notamment et vous devez aussi évaluer vos programmes d'étirement d'assouplissement en utilisant des, bah, des flexomètres, par exemple un flexomètre ici, euh, c'est un, un ce petit, euh, ce, petit, euh, euh, ce petit outil là où, voilà, où le, le jeune se met assis, j'ai entendu, et puis il doit essayer de pousser la petite réglette rouge le plus loin possible, euh, j'ai entendu. Euh, et donc là, c'est un, voilà, un test, je pense que vous devez le faire, euh, un test qui vous permet vraiment d'évaluer ben, la, la souplesse finalement de, de du tronc et de la chaîne musculaire postérieure. Alors le problème, attention lorsque vous faites ces évaluations au moment de l'adolescence, parce que, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure, l'enfant grandit d'abord par les membres inférieurs, ensuite par le tronc, donc il vous suffit d'avoir un jeune qui a passé son TVC, qui a un tronc qui, va, qui grandit, pour que le test s'améliore naturellement. Donc attention aussi de ce qui relève de l'effet de la croissance du tronc et de l'effet du programme d'étirement que vous proposez. Donc attention à bien discerner les deux. Ensuite, vous avez euh, l'endurance musculaire. Alors l'endurance musculaire, elle est importante à, 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 à travailler au moment du PVC parce que comme vous le voyez ici, vous avez l'évolution de la capacité oxydative du muscle euh, qu'on appelle Vmax. Et cette capacité oxydative musculaire, euh, elle, elle diminue fortement au moment de la puberté. Ici, vous avez l'étude de Taylor, un groupe anglais, dans les années 90, qui montrait euh, qu'au moment de la puberté, vous voyez, entre euh, l'enfance et, et le jeune euh, stade adulte, vous avez une forte baisse de la capacité oxydative du muscle. Euh, et donc ensuite, vous avez une baisse qui continue à, à évoluer avec le temps jusqu'au stade de, de senior. Et vous, en tant que préparateur physique, ce qui est important, c'est vraiment de lutter contre cette baisse de cette capacité oxydative, parce que cette capacité oxydative, elle, elle conditionne le développement de la fatigue du muscle et ensuite elle conditionne la récupération euh, post-exercice. Post Donc il faut absolument maintenir cette capacité oxydative, il faut proposer euh, bah, de l'endurance, 
de l'endurance fondamentale, alors ce n'est pas du travail continu, à intensité modérée mais prolongée, et, ou, ou bien de l'intermittent, euh, de manière à pouvoir lutter contre cette baisse de cette capacité oxydative. Et, et cette baisse, elle a lieu à tous les niveaux dans le corps, c'est-à-dire au niveau des fléchisseurs plantaires, au niveau des quadriceps, au niveau des fléchisseurs des doigts. En fait, les études euh, qui ont été faites, elles le démontrent à, à tous les niveaux. Alors après, vous avez, euh, si on rentre, on, rentre, on rentre un petit peu plus dans le phénotype, euh, le phénotype musculaire, euh, comment il évolue avec la, la croissance, vous voyez que très tôt, en fait, euh, vous voyez, à 5-10 ans, les enfants, ils ont un fort pourcentage de fibres lentes, de fibres oxydatives. Et puis, ce pourcentage-là, il diminue avec, euh, avec la, la, la croissance. Euh, à, à 20 ans, vous voyez, en moyenne, hein, on est à peu près à 50% de fibres lentes, 50% de fibres rapides. Donc vous avez naturellement avec le développement une, une baisse de ce pourcentage de fibres oxydatives. Donc forcément une baisse de cette capacité oxydative au niveau, au niveau musculaire. Donc, euh, alors ça c'est chez... Si on a affaire à des adultes qui sont entraînés en endurance, hein, des athlètes de haut niveau bien entraînés en endurance, ces athlètes là ont un fort pourcentage de fibres lentes. Hein, c'est ce qu'on retrouve chez les enfants. Si vous prenez les meilleurs athlètes euh, entraînés en endurance, ils ont 70% de fibres lentes. En moyenne, ce qui correspond à ce que vous avez chez les enfants préculaires. C'est la même chose au niveau de l'activité de la, la succinate déshydrogénase, la SDH, enzyme oxydative euh, clé du, du cycle de Krebs. Et là, vous avez euh, au niveau du vaste latéral, vous voyez que les enfants préculaires ont aussi une activité de la SDH relativement importante, mais qui baisse au moment de la puberté. C'est-à-dire lorsqu'on compare des enfants préculaires à des adultes non entraînés, on a une baisse de cette activité euh, oxydative enzymatique. Si on compare maintenant des adultes qui sont entraînés en endurance, vous voyez que l'activité de la SDH est relativement comparable avec, euh, avec les enfants préculaires. Donc ça veut dire que l'entraînement pourrait permettre de lutter contre cette baisse de cette activité oxydative enzymatique. Euh, au niveau maintenant des débits de resynthèse de la phosphocréatine, lorsqu'on regarde le demi-temps de récupération de la phosphocréatine, euh, c'est-à-dire le temps nécessaire pour reconstituer 50% des réserves initiales après l'exercice, vous voyez que le demi-temps, en fait, le TCR, il est de 12 secondes chez les enfants pétubères. C'est-à-dire qu'en une douzaine de secondes, les enfants pétubères sont capables de, de répléter la moitié de leur, de leur réserve. Euh, L'adulte non entraîné, il lui faut ben, deux fois plus de temps, on dépasse les 25 secondes. Les seniors, ben, c'est encore plus long, hein, plus de 30 secondes. Et maintenant, les adultes qui sont entraînés en endurance, ils ont un demi-temps de synthèse de la phosphocratine qui est comparable à celui des, des enfants, des enfants prépubérants. C'est un argument supplémentaire qui vous montre qu'il est important de faire de l'endurance au moment de l'adolescence et après, de manière, vous voyez, à, à retomber sur, euh, ben, sur des demi-temps qui correspondent à ceux d'enfants prépubérants. Donc le travail d'endurance, en fait, est fondamental pour préserver le potentiel oxydatif chez les, chez les adolescents et chez les adultes. Voilà. Et donc, repousser la fatigabilité à l'effort et euh, assurer une meilleure récupération après, après l'effort. Et ça, c'est illustré ici à travers cette diapositive. Regardez la récupération. Là, c'est la première thèse de Wingate, une thèse de 30 secondes sur l'ergocycle. Là, c'est une étude de 93 des équipes allemandes qui vous montre qu'en en, en deux minutes, l'enfant prépubère, il est capable de reproduire sa puissance maximale. Alors que nous, en tant qu'adultes, non entraînés, enfin, moi je me place dans les non entraînés, il faut, il faut plus de 10 minutes pour récupérer la puissance maximale. C'est-à-dire 5 fois plus de temps à un adulte non entraîné par rapport à un, à un enfant, enfant prépubère. Vous voyez, donc avec le temps, euh, lorsqu'on grandit, euh, lorsqu'on passe la puberté, on a beaucoup plus de mal à récupérer après des efforts intensifs. Là, vous avez l'illustration de ce qui se passe sur les séries de sprints de 10 secondes avec 30 secondes de pause entre les sprints. Ici, en rouge, vous avez l'évolution de la puissance maximale mesurée au cours de chaque sprint. Vous voyez, chez les enfants prépubères, en rouge, il n'y a pas de baisse de puissance. Les enfants sont capables de maintenir leur puissance. Alors qu'un adolescent de 14-15 ans va baisser sa puissance de 20% et l'adulte de 29%. Ça veut dire qu'avec l'âge... Euh, on prend de la puissance, mais on est moins capable de la réitérer après des, des, des sprints, euh, des, sur les sprints traités. Et au niveau cardiaque, c'est exactement la même chose. Ici, c'est une, une étude toute récente qu'on vient de publier 
après une épreuve maximale sur piste, hein, on a fait faire un lame à des, à des enfants qui récupèrent, des adultes non entraînés et des athlètes endurants, très entraînés dans l'endurance. Ici, vous voyez, vous avez la récupération d'un fréquence cardiaque. Euh, vous avez une récupération cardiaque qui est très rapide chez les enfants et les, et les athlètes, comparable. Et cette récupération est plus rapide par, par rapport à des adultes non entraînés. Et là, on a fait de la variabilité cardiaque, on a mesuré un marqueur de la réactivation parasympathique, c'est-à-dire le marqueur RMSSD. Et vous voyez, dès le début de la récupération, ben, les enfants et les athlètes sont capables de réactiver plus vite leur système nerveux parasympathique et donc de freiner, euh, de tirer sur le frein à main plus rapidement et de baisser plus rapidement la fréquence cardiaque. Alors, les adultes non entraînés, vous voyez ici en, en, en noir, ben, la réactivation parasympathique, elle n'a pas lieu au départ. Et elle commence à, à, à apparaître vous voyez, au bout de, de 3 minutes seulement. Donc en fait, euh, on a exactement la même réponse au niveau cardiaque et au niveau musculaire lorsqu'on compare des enfants, des athlètes et des, et, et des, adultes, euh, des athlètes et des adultes non entraînés. Euh, la force, euh, bah, je vous en ai parlé un petit peu. Ce qui est important, euh, voilà, c'est vraiment de de proposer de la force au moment du, du TVC parce que et avant, au moment et après le TVC parce que on n'est pas là pour hypertrophier un muscle, on n'est pas là pour faire la charge maximale, c'est pas le but, mais on est là pour prévenir, faire de la prévention primaire, c'est-à-dire que la croissance en elle-même, elle, elle, elle décompense euh, certains groupes musculaires, il euh, y a des équilibres de force euh, entre les muscles agonistes, antagonistes. Les articulations ne sont pas forcément bien équilibrées musculairement parce qu'il y, y a ces fameux déséquilibres de force, de part et d'autre de l'articulation. Donc le but finalement c'est de faire de la recompensation. Euh, alors éviter les asymétries ou réduire les asymétries alors, entre le membre latéral, contralatéral, entre euh, les muscles agonistes, antagonistes. Et en fait, la force en fait, elle doit être faite de manière à pouvoir faire du rééquilibrage. Euh, c'est le cas ici par exemple chez. Euh, euh, chez la fille, euh, là ici vous avez des rapports de force entre les quadriceps et les ischios jambiers. Là, vous avez des garçons euh, prépubères, postpubères et des filles prépubères, postpubères. Alors, chez les garçons, visiblement, les ratios sont relativement corrects. On est à 1,5, c'est-à-dire que les quadriceps sont 1,5 fois plus forts que les, que les ischios jambiers. Maintenant, les filles, vous voyez que le ratio il est beaucoup plus élevé, notamment chez les postpubères, où là on dépasse les, le, le 2. C'est-à-dire que chez les filles post-pubères, notamment chez les footballeuses, vous avez des quadriceps qui sont deux fois plus forts que les ischio jambiers. Et ça, c'est un problème parce que lorsqu'on a un tel déséquilibre, c'est l'articulation du genou qui est moins bien maintenue et ça peut amener à des, à des problèmes ligamentaires, des ruptures du ligament croisé antérieur, des, problèmes, des, des ruptures des ligaments collatéraux, euh, internes, externes. Donc vous voyez que le but finalement, pour moi, c'est de faire du rééquilibrage et de renforcer les cyclos jambiers pour réduire ce fameux, ce fameux ratio. Euh, je vois qu'il me reste 5 minutes. Euh, alors aussi chez les filles, vous avez souvent, chez les filles footballeuses, vous avez souvent des, vous avez des genoux en, en valgus ici. Alors le valgus dynamique, il est problématique parce que euh, lorsque vous avez sur des réceptions de saut des, ou, des, ou des impulsions de saut, ben, des genoux qui se mettent comme ça en valgus, vous euh, voyez que euh, le risque c'est encore une fois des blessures ligamentaires au niveau du ligament croisé antérieur, des ligaments latéraux, euh, internes ou externes. Et ce valgus, généralement, il est lié à une faiblesse des, des abducteurs, c'est-à-dire petits et moyens fessiers. Si les enfants ont une faiblesse au niveau des abducteurs de la hanche, vous avez une adduction de la hanche, une rotation interne de la hanche, et forcément des genoux qui se mettent en valgus avec des pieds qui se mettent en éversion, c'est-à-dire que sur les impulsions ou les réceptions de saut, les pieds ne sont pas à plat sur le sol. Et donc ça peut créer des équilibres et forcément des blessures ou des chutes. Donc le but du jeu, en fait, c'est de pouvoir faire de la recompensation, renforcer les abducteurs de manière à pouvoir remettre les genoux dans l'alignement du corps. La particularité de la fille, c'est que elle, quand elle passe sa puberté, son bassin s'élargit. Et lorsque vous avez un élargissement du bassin, vous avez également des genoux qui se mettent en valgus. Voilà. Et aussi des oestrogènes qui se produisent énormément à la puberté euh, seraient à l'origine d'une hyper, hyperlaxité euh, ligamentaire. Donc euh, s'il y a une hyperlaxité, pareil, les genoux sont, bien, sont moins bien maintenus. Alors ce n'est pas que sur des impulsions de saut ou des, euh, ou des réceptions de saut, ça peut être aussi le problème, de, peut être sur des changements de direction, où vous avez des genoux qui peuvent partir euh, un peu à droite à gauche. Attention aussi 
aux exercices qui nécessitent des changements rapides de direction. Voilà. Euh, euh, quelques mots sur le gainage. Le gainage est relativement important. Un, pour essayer de bien protéger la colonne vertébrale qui grandit énormément après le TVC de la taille. Euh, et puis aussi pour assurer tous les transferts, c'est-à-dire que lorsqu'on fait de l'impulsion, eh euh, tout passe par la ceinture abdominale. Hein. Donc il faut que la ceinture abdominale elle soit bien tonifiée, euh, qu'il y ait un bon gainage de manière à ce que le transfert de force puisse se faire facilement du bas vers par le haut. Euh, ça c'est important. Euh, aussi pour des frappes, des contres, des lancers, il faut vraiment que le, le tronc soit bien maintenu, l'équilibre soit, soit, soit correct. Voilà, pour la performance et puis pour la protection de, de l'organisme. Ça passe par euh, voilà, différents euh, jeux, ça peut être du, des, du travail avec le Swiss ball, ça peut être euh, voilà, des jeux de la brouette, ça peut être euh, voilà, des montées sur bloc, etc. Bon, ça, euh, euh, il y a des tas d'exemples, des tas d'exercices qui, qui peuvent être proposés chez les jeunes. Euh, de toute manière, l'entraînement de la force, il est efficace si les règles de recommandation euh, sont, euh, sont respectées, les règles d'usage sont respectées. Encore une fois, il faut faire les choses correctement et euh, on peut faire de la force avec du petit matériel, ça peut être des haltères, avec des medicine balls, des swiss balls, des, des élastiques, avec le propre poids du corps de l'enfant, ça peut être des tractions, des, euh, des, euh, des pompes, etc. Mais, on n'a pas forcément besoin d'un gros équipement pour faire du renforcement. Mais en tout cas, c'est à but, à but préventif. Voilà. Euh, voilà. Euh, quelques mots rapides sur euh, ben, l'outil de prédiction de l'âge du PVC. Vous allez sur Internet, euh, vous avez des outils qui vous permettent à partir de la date de naissance, de la date du test, de la taille de boule, de la taille assise et du poids. Donc ici, vous retrouvez les, les fameuses euh, rentrées que, que l'on met dans le logiciel. Et vous avez une prédiction de l'âge qui va correspondre au PVC. Donc là, vous avez l'exemple d'un garçon qui a 11 ans à peu près. Euh, son âge euh, prédit, estimé du PVC de la taille, c'est 14 ans. C'est-à-dire que lorsqu'on fait la différence entre l'âge chronologique et l'âge du PVC, vous voyez, on est à moins 3,3. C'est-à-dire que l'enfant, il, il va être à 3,3 ans de son pic rapide de, de croissance de la taille. Voilà. Euh, donc pour conclure... Il me reste une minute pour conclure. Je vous dirais qu'il est très important, euh, dans tout suivi accompagnement d'un jeune, de considérer son âge chronologique, son âge biologique, c'est-à-dire son âge qui va correspondre au PVC de sa taille, et son âge relatif. Il faut considérer les trois âges dans le suivi de l'accompagnement des jeunes. C'est très important. Euh, deuxième message, c'est d'essayer euh, d'utiliser de, euh, ces fameux outils de prédiction de l'âge du PVC. Parce que ça va vous permettre de mieux organiser, mieux structurer votre entraînement, notamment au niveau du contenu, des qualités physiques à développer, mais aussi euh, essayer voilà, d'éviter les blessures, l'apparition des blessures par rapport à ce PVC. Euh, et dernier point, dernier message, c'est que euh, dans la structuration des, des qualités euh, à développer chez l'enfant, il faut absolument développer les, quali les qualités motrices euh, très tôt. C'est-à-dire lorsque le système nerveux central mature euh, tôt, il faut en profiter. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut vraiment travailler les habiletés motrices, la coordination, l'équilibre, la drette, ce sont des habiletés motrices qui sont indispensables à développer avant de pouvoir développer les qualités physiques, c'est-à-dire de force, de vitesse, de puissance, d'endurance, de souplesse. Donc il faut avoir ça en tête. La motricité chez l'enfant, c'est fondamental. La qualité de force et de puissance aussi pour essayer de, comment dire, de protéger l'organisme qui est en pleine phase de croissance et, et, et encore immature. Donc la force, elle est là, il faut, faut la proposer, il faut la développer, pas pour hypertrophier, mais prévenir les risques de blessure. Donc, il faut at attaquer très tôt la force et la puissance, c'est important. Hein. Et ensuite, pour, pour terminer, l'endurance, elle se travaille, mais elle doit être préservée euh, au moment du PVC où vous avez vraiment une baisse de ce potentiel oxydatif. Donc il ne faut euh, pas hésiter à, à à maintenir, entretenir ce potentiel oxydatif au moment du PVC et après le PVC. Et la souplesse, c'est une qualité physique indispensable aussi pour éviter les blessures et optimiser la performance. Et la souplesse, elle tend à baisser au moment où euh, l'enfant prend de la masse musculaire. Donc il faut essayer de faire de la souplesse voilà, autour du PVC et après. Voilà. En tout cas, je, je vous remercie de votre attention et je, je me tiens à votre disposition pour euh, d'éventuelles questions.
Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Merci, Monsieur Sébastien Radel, pour cette présentation très, très riche et euh, plein d'informations à propos de l'intérêt de, de l'argument scientifique pour une préparation des équipes de l'enfant. Donc, est-ce qu'il y a des questions chez le public qui sont en ligne ou bien qui sont présentes On commence par euh, Mademoiselle Ayr. Oui, alors c'est une bonne, bonne question. Alors, il ne faut pas croire que la, la filière lactique est immature à ce qui est Alors, j'ai un retour de son, hein, excusez-moi. Ah, en fait, il ne faut, ouais, faut pas croire en fait, que la, la filière lactique lactique est immature avant, avant la, la puberté. Aujourd'hui, on, on pense le contraire, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut considérer que les trois filières énergétiques elles sont matures chez les enfants, même pré pubères cest C'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a aucune raison qu'il y ait une filière immature. Les trois fonctionnent. Seulement, l'enfant, lui, va privilégier beaucoup plus sa filière aérobie au détriment des filières anaérobies. Euh, donc, en fait, euh, l'argument de dire que euh, l'enfant a moins de glycogène en réserve, c'est n'est pas un bon argument pour considérer que la filière lactique est immature avant la puberté, parce que lorsque vous faites un effort de type lactique, euh, si vous faites une biopsie musculaire euh, dans le bas latéral, euh, après un exercice lactique, vous aurez toujours du glycogène dans le muscle. Donc le glycogène n'est pas un facteur limitant euh, dans le fonctionnement de la filière lactique. Euh, ça, c'est euh, quelque chose qu'il faut avoir à l'esprit. Euh, la filière lactique, en fait, elle est... vous pouvez la travailler avant, avant la puberté. Il y a... Vous avez une vieille étude de, des années 70, les travaux d'Erickson et Salty, qui vous montraient qu'après 6 semaines d'entraînement, euh, à raison de 2-3 séances par semaine, sans faire du lactif, hein, c'est du travail euh, intermittent, travail mixte qui sollicitait l'aérobie et l'anaérobie, euh, déjà dans les années 70, les, les chercheurs ont montré qu'après entraînement, la PFK, la phosphofructoquinase, qui est une enzyme euh, clé du, du, de la filière lactique, elle était augmentée euh, de plus de 40% chez l'enfant prépubère. Donc en fait, la filière lactique, elle est entraînable avant la puberté. Euh, maintenant, la, la question est de savoir, est-ce qu'il y a un, un intérêt de faire du lactique avant la puberté Alors, vous pouvez en faire un petit peu de lactique. Euh, rien ne l'interdit. Mais ayez à l'esprit qu'un enfant, lorsqu'il vient s'entraîner, il faut qu'il euh, bah, qu vienne avec. Euh, qu'il prenne du plaisir, qu'il. Qu euh, qui, euh, euh, qui se sent bien à l'entraînement, euh, parce que le lactique c'est quand même assez éprouvant quand même, c'est relativement intensif. Euh, bon, il faut, il faut, je pense, à mon sens, amener progressivement le lactique dans l'entraînement pour pas que ça soit une priorité avant la puberté. Il euh, n'y a pas de raison d'interdire, mais je pense qu'il faut introduire ce type d'effort de manière progressive euh, et avoir plus en tête le travail de la motricité, comme je vous le disais, avant, avant la, la, la puberté. Voilà. Merci, euh, Monsieur Raten, pour cette, euh, ces explications et les informations. Euh, Docteur Omar Hamoud, euh, vous voulez vous intervenir Ou juste vous inscrire Oui, oui, oui s'il vous plaît. Merci, Professeur Raten, pour euh, cet excellent exposé. Euh, vous mentionnez dans vos publications récentes que l'enfant peut être comparable à un athlète d'endurance de haut niveau. Euh, vous avez souligné l'importance de préserver l'endurance, surtout autour du PVC. Jusqu'à quel niveau euh, on peut euh, augmenter l'intensité des exercices d'endurance sans pour autant avoir euh, des risques augmentés de blessures euh, durant cette période euh, de fragilité au trio articulaire et est-ce qu'on peut se permettre 
de préconiser les exercices d'intervalle de sprint, d'intervalle de haute intensité, plutôt que les, plutôt que les exercices continus, euh, connaissant ce secteur récupération cardiaque et lactique plus rapide chez l'enfant. Merci. Alors, il faut toujours respecter ce principe de progression de la charge de travail, de toute façon, parce qu'en fait, pour éviter les blessures, il faut que cette vitesse de montée en charge elle soit contrôlée. C'est-à-dire que si vous avez une vitesse de montée en charge trop importante, euh, notamment euh, avant le PVC ou autour du PVC, là, vous risquez de blesser euh, euh, les, les jeunes. Euh, donc là, là, il y a vraiment euh, cette charge de travail euh, à, à bien contrôler, à augmenter progressivement pour éviter les blessures. Donc, alors, vous pouvez, euh, bien entendu, augmenter euh, le volume euh, aérobie. Euh, alors, pour augmenter le volume aérobie et, et préserver, on va dire, la charpente et l'organisme de, de l'enfant, il ne faut pas hésiter à faire de la méthode croisée, c'est-à-dire à, à, à mélanger des activités à poids porté et non porté. Euh, comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, vous, ben, vous pouvez mélanger euh, des activités de course à pied à des activités euh, de natation, à des activités de cyclisme. Euh, donc c'est nous en France on a le duathlon, la quadplon, on a le triathlon. Euh, nous on, a, on suit des jeunes depuis longtemps sur du rêve de multisport de nature, c'est-à-dire c'est des jeunes de 13-14 ans qui font des championnats de France euh, et qui font euh, des sorties de, de, de 5h30-6h. Hein. Donc euh, en termes de volume, ça ne pose aucun problème. Ils sont bien sûr adaptés à entraîner à cette, à cette, à cette modalité de pratique. Mais le rêve multisport de nature, c'est quoi C'est du VTT, c'est de la, de la course d'orientation c'est du, euh, du kayak, c'est du, du roller, vous voyez, donc là il y a un mélange aussi d'activités à quoi porter non porter. Euh, donc, euh, et ensuite en termes de, de modalité, l'intermittent, moi ça me semble très important notamment avant la puberté parce que comme vous l'avez vu, euh, les enfants récupèrent très vite après les efforts, donc euh, ils s'adaptent très facilement à l'intermittent. Euh, D'ailleurs, ça correspond très très bien à leur activité spontanée. Donc, il ne faut pas hésiter à faire l'intermittent avant la puberté. C'est une manière de les engager dans la, dans la pratique sportive. Et au moment de l'adolescence, après, tout dépend ce que vous voulez développer. Si c'est plutôt ben, la capacité de la filière aérobie ou la puissance de la filière aérobie, on sait que voilà, pour faire de la capacité aérobie, il ben, faut faire des volumes assez conséquents mais à intensité modérée. Euh, si vous voulez travailler la puissance aérobie, euh, c'est-à-dire sur des intensités proches de l'eau de max, ben, il va falloir faire l'intermittent parce qu'il voilà, faut quand même être à plus de 80% de la FC max pour euh, voilà, essayer de développer cette fameuse puissance aérobie. Donc, il faut jouer sur les deux tableaux si vous voulez vraiment optimiser la filière aérobie euh, au moment d'adolescence et après. Merci beaucoup de tous ces éclaircissements. Je vous en prie. Merci, au revoir. Thank you very much.
I think that uh, you need to allow me to uh, add my presentation because at the moment I have not. So I see that I, I don't have any option to add my presentation to share my screen. You, are, you should be able to share your presentation, please. Yes, uh, I don't have the option, so um, maybe if you click on my name, uh, probably you have the opportunity to go on my name and say uh, allow to share presentation, or I sh allow you to, um, to show the screen.
Newton and the Rubik's theory here, it is a, a good life, of course. But if you uh, refine it too much, it is okay also.
Yes, I can hear you, but yeah. uh, it's an issue. So I just joined again and uh, I cannot uh, share my uh, screen automatically. So uh, you can share your screen. So what do you have? Is it a Windows or a Mac? A Mac. Oh, so a Mac is something we cannot handle actually because we have different versions. <laughs> yeah, actually, we have the software is completely different from Mac. So, there, yes, should, it's fine, so okay. there should be an arrow inside a box. Yes. You can see it. Yes. Great. All right. Now, now, now work. Now it's fine. Because before I tried, it didn't work. Give me a second. I should be able to share that. Let me try it. Okay. Okay. It's not this one. Sorry, guys. But uh, desktop open. Windows. Uh, go. Give me a second. Yes, but it is not that fine. Give me only a second. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Mm -hmm. No, it's not good. Give me a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Just take your time because we, we are here waiting for you. Which was sharing. Yes. Here we. Okay. We should be a bit. Give me a second that is now loading. <laughs> okay. All right. Give me a second because there are some videos where it's okay. So probably that was the motivation because on Mac sometimes it doesn't work yeah. with yeah. me. I need to add the last version. Yeah, actually it's hard to use instructions. Okay. All right. Okay. I think you can see that now. Yeah, not exactly. Oh yeah. Uh, you you should have a lot of notification, testing, and training periodizations in play with device and spot. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you want to take a start, <laughs> yes, so sorry guys for the issue, I think, uh, yes, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so uh, I'm Marco Beato, Associate Professor in Sport and Exercise Science at the University of Suffolk in the UK. Uh, today I will present uh, this presentation titled Quantification, Testing and Training Periodization Using Flaming Devices in Sport. And I would want to thank you for the opportunity. I think this opportunity to acknowledge uh, your invitation. Thank you very much for that. And uh, in particular for, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, but there is uh, Shatoro Handi, or Handi, the person that uh, was in contact with me. So thank you very much for this invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. And thank you also to, to wait this time <laughs> for my technical issue. So, uh, I want to start this presentation explaining the background of flyweight training. This type of training was initially proposed to mitigate the neuromuscular dysfunctions and concurrent sarcopenia caused by the small amount of gravity present in space, which affected astronauts during space travel. So the background is very, very nice because it comes from this topic. In this slide, you can see a schematic representation of a, schema of a, of a stack machine. And on the right, you can see a schematic representation of a flywheel device. The main difference between the two devices is that the stack machine needs gravity for the locking and resistance. So it's a traditional machine that you have in any gym, like a leg press, like a separation, while the flywheel device doesn't need that depth. Since this type of technology is gravity independent. And as you can see in the slide, you see there is a wheel. Okay, and from there, the name flywheel device. For such a reason, flywheel devices were used to contrast the negative effect of low gravity of muscular function in astronauts during space uh, travel. Why is training so important during space travel? So what was the motivation of this type of training? 
because uh, space flight has been associated with the decrement of muscular and performance parameter in the order of 2% a week during the initial phase of a space mission, which will be an important health and performance issue for the astronauts. Therefore, the reported benefit of uh, regular training in terms of muscle strength and muscle gain, because we know that obviously recent training helps in, uh, in this way, hypertonic exercise such as waist stack machine, also free weight, could not be used in space during the space travel because our gravity depends on the side. So if there is low gravity, uh, there is not the same resistance that we have on, on Earth. So this was an interaction for the implementation of flywheel resistant training in this specific scenario. So now that we know the initial background, then we can move to the application of technology in sport. And uh, we know that after the first pioneer studies, sports science and later practitioners understood the advantages offered by flywheel technology and they started to use flywheel training to perform uh, to increase performance, to have uh, muscle development, injury prevention, and also for clinical rehabilitation. So now this type of device can be found in several gyms, in high performance football club, cricket club, as well as in clinical rehabilitation because we know the benefits of this training. Uh, for instance, for example, this paper that I reported in this slide, published by Tesh 2004, found that flowing training is capable to develop some significant chronic adaptation only in two weeks of training. It is something that was very useful for uh, the initial scientists, for the application of it in, uh, in for the astronauts, but also for athletes, because with athletes sometimes we don't have a lot of time for training, we need to have quick adaptation, and this type of device, this type of technology, seem to be able to do that. But the what is the rationale that supports the implementation of flywheel training? So a change of exercise, which is a component of flywheel exercise, has some unique characteristics compared to both concentric and isometric functions. So for instance, eccentric contraction is accompanied by higher force output production compared to the concentric or isometric contraction. Lower energy expenditure compared with both isometric and concentric muscle contraction that result in a greater work efficiency during the change of training. This is a great advantage of the change of training compared to uh, isometric and concentric contractions. This greater force production and efficiency generally are attributed, so this one is the physiological principle, to the higher number of Apache cross bridges and by the passive contribution of the passive structures element engaged in the sarcoma during the lengthening phase, so during the eccentric phase. So remember that the eccentric phase is when we lengthen the muscle, the concentric phase is the compact, when the muscle became shorter. So moreover, in this slide you can see a systematic review published by Douglas that summarizes the evidence of eccentric training. And uh, if you're interested in eccentric training, this paper is really brilliant. So I recommend you to read the test. And in particular, one of the figures that are important in this review is that the French uh, says that the training can improve muscle mechanical function to a greater extent than other training modalities. So we know for the moment from this slide and also a bit from the background of flywheel training that eccentric is very useful to improve uh, strength and to obtain a muscle adaptation very quickly, but also seem to a greater extent than concentric contraction. So, moreover, we know that the chicken training can induce some other important adaptation. Some of them are chronic neural adaptation, for example, increased motor unit synchronization, so things that happen generally very quickly at the beginning of the training, after three, four weeks. Obviously, you can have that for a longer time, but generally, you have this adaptation very quickly. And some other morphological adaptation, so we mean the change in structures, so for example, could be a uh, detonation angle. However, fluid training benefits are not only related to the change of phase, but they are due to, to the combination of concentric and eccentric contraction during the same exercise. We will see later some videos, but every Monday, from a research point of view, focus a lot on the change of phase. But we, um, we didn't focus also on the concentric phase of the exercise. Fluid training benefits 
come from the combination of both concentric and eccentric and this combination seem the specific motivation for this neural and morphological adaptation. In this specific slide you can see that there is a comparison between a stack machine on the left and a Fleming device on the right. Uh, if, you, if you watch, I added some arrows in orange uh, that can add to the time back of the figure. So when I talk of the I will address you to each uh, slide or each uh, arrow of, of the picture. So you can see that there is a dominant phase using the stack machine in the concentric contraction where you can find high power force in the electromyography and you can see the first R, all right? But these parameters are underloaded in the chantry phase, that is the uh, second R. You can see if you watch the, the power, the curve of the power uh, is quite flat in the uh, chantry phase, particularly the concentric phase is very high. If you check the electromyography, it's very demanding in the first part, but not very demanding in the second part. So, uh, reality, when we check uh, what happened in, uh, in the Flywood device, uh, you can see that, uh, the, that is the picture of the right, you can see there is development of power, force, and uh, general, there is a generation of muscle activation in bodies. And if you check in the thing, you can see reality that the change in phase is a bit more demanding. So the other four, if you check a bit of the chromiography, you can see that it's a bit higher. But anyway, the critical point here is that both phases are well loaded, and this is a key characteristic of this type of training. So when we talk about fluid training, don't think about only the eccentric contraction, but also the concentric contraction. So in this slide, you can see a meta-analysis by published by Marotti Piazzo, that is a friend of mine, that report the benefit of fluid training compared to gravity-dependent resistance training in terms of strength, that is the first arrow, muscle power, second arrow, and hypertrophy. It is the third arrow. As well as the same author reported some specific adaptation in jump performance and also sprint. However, you can see that in this slide I put two small arrows. Why? Because the number of studies that have investigated jump and sprint performance after this type of training are limited in number and in particular on sprint performance if you check there are only two studies. So we are not completely sure, and some studies there are conflicting results. So we should be careful when we talk about uh, jump and sprint adaptation after this training. But we know that there are uh, strength improvement, power improvement, and hypertrophy uh, improvement. Okay. So. Uh, in, this, uh, um, in this slide, you can find also another uh, systematic review and meta analysis published by uh, Javier Raya Gonzalez that summarized the effect of fluid training on jump performance, sprinting, and change of direction. If you think it's exactly uh, the, the completion, I would say, the second phase of the previous slide, I would probably say that we didn't have too much evidence about the jump performance and sprint performance. Here has been analyzed also change of direction. But in this specific slide, you see that we have improved in performance, sprint performance, and change of direction. But uh, here we are not talking about elite athletes. We are talking more about uh, sport population in general. And also in this case, you can see there are some evidence that seem uh, pretty positive. But if you check, for example, the uh, jump performance, that is the first uh, part of this picture, the first meta analysis, there are uh, five studies that have this horizontal bar, that is a confidence interval, that cross the vertical central line. This means that the evidence are not so strong, and we have some, say, um, conflict results, so we are not sure. Obviously, when you plot everything together, and you see that the final uh, sign that we have um, um, on the bottom, that represents, obviously, the summary of all the effects, you can see that the confidence interval became much smaller. So we can say from this analysis that we decided that we're in our hands, there are positive indications for improvement in jump, sprint, change of performance after the wheel, but the reality is that we don't have enough studies, especially when we talk about in this case uh, change of direction. So in my opinion, this is obviously in my opinion, more research is needed. 
So, do we know something about how you play in particular in professional leagues or in football? Uh, obviously, football is one of my topics, as well as how we play. And for this motivation, this year in 2021, my group and I have published this systematic record because we were very testing on the application of how we play in professional football. So, the aim was to evaluate the current literature from the chronic effect of how we play. So, chronic effect, not the effect on physical capacity, so a player has to identify all the areas uh, for, um, to establish new, uh, new guidelines and also to give an uh, indicator for future research. So what we know about chronic adaptation in football, we know that 11 studies met the crucial criteria and were included here. And uh, this is a key point, as you can see from the arrow, we have only 11 studies that have uh, analyzed chronic adaptation in a soccer player. And if you think that this type of technology is used, is spread everywhere and that it was, uh, is used generally in a, in a professional level, from Premier League to Serie A to uh, La Liga, uh, we don't have so much evidence. Anyway, what is the take home message of this radio? We have two take home messages. So in football, only considered football player, we know that a diverse range of every training intervention can effectively improve strength, power, jump, and change of direction. However, when we talk about sprinting capacity and in particular acceleration, we don't see clear improvement after playing training. So if someone should ask me in a football team, do you use playing training at the moment? Yes, I suggest you to use that to improve power, jump, change of direction, and also strength, in particular, a change of strength. But if you expect to have movement from a speed or acceleration, we are not completely sure. Maybe you will add that, but we are not completely sure. Uh, what we know uh, as a company about uh, female athletes, because uh, as you can see, a lot of research has been done on male participants, and uh, uh, in science, uh, we have this issue that, that uh, there is a difference between uh, the, the, the genders. So uh, generally there is a lot more research on male and less on female. So what we did in 2020, we tried during the lockdown in reality, we tried to summarize the areas also about, um, about uh, female and female training. And we found that this technology is a safe and time effective strategy to enhance physical outcome with both young and elderly females. So what was the take-home message of this uh, systematic review? That the practitioner can prescribe the training as an effective way to prevent muscle risk or force in the elderly population. So this is related to the elderly population, as well as it is a very good stimulus for physical enhancement in young female population. So in this case, we mean, uh, for example, uh, young soccer player or basketball player. Uh, that is very useful. But there is, for the moment, a lack of clarity about the exact dose, trade week, uh, frequency or intensity when we have female athletes, because only seven studies were found uh, in the research, systematic research for this type of systematic review, and uh, obviously more research is needed, so we cannot be 100% sure that the guidelines reported in systematic review are, say, uh, the final guidelines. We need more research. When we will have maybe 15, 20 papers, uh, these guidelines will change. So, uh, now we, we the, now that we know the background, we know uh, the, everything about the current literature of public training, we can start our, uh, we can have our research, uh, first research question, which is, can we offer precise recommendations on how to design and prescribe public training in elite athletes? So in this case, I'm talking about elite athletes. I'm not talking about uh, the general population. So to answer this question, the answer is yes. In 2020, I published with a colleague, Andrea Del Viacomo, that is watching Scotland at the moment, uh, he's an Italian guy like me, uh, the following uh, paper that is published in front of this study is the first to summarize the official guidelines for the use of plywood training in elite athletes. And what we know about this team, we know that the intensity range from 0.05 until 0.11 kilograms times the square, that is the inertia load, okay, so the intensity, are 
Now, Jerry recommended me those chronic adaptation and enhance the athletic performance. About the training volume, we know that the Jerry quality set are better and should be recommended instead of single set exercises and generally the, uh, the repetition that we suggest are in a range between 6, 8 and it's not needed to have 12, 14, 15 repetitions. We know that the 6, 8 repetition with the right combination of inertia and boom, generally are super safe. And what about the training time? We know that generally you need to, before to see some result, you need to wait at least 5 10 weeks. The major part of the study analyzes this uh, 10 windows. 5 weeks is quite short, so you will see some benefits, but maybe you will not see many chronic adaptation from a, a morphological point of view, but you will see narrow adaptation. And generally, a training frequency of 2 3 sessions per week is what we have seen in the literature. So, the next question is the following one. The female opinion is very important because uh, uh, every training has been used in, a, is used in professional team sport for this uh, purpose. So, do we have evidence that support the use of a wheel spread training for muscle injury prevention? So, coming back again to this paper, the same paper that I just uh, uh, about, we know that uh, training training may also be implemented as an injury prevention strategy. To do it with protective role related to the chest component. This could be particularly important for accounting muscle injuries. So, you know, it's useful for the motivation of high speed running and those for the mechanics of the running. The hamstring uh, generally have a high risk of injury, so, it's one of the muscles that has a high probability. Uh, since there is an important eccentric component during the running activity, but there is also a eccentric component during the training, this secondary could be suitable for reduce the likelihood of injuries. This assumption is supported by previous evidence reported that 10 weeks of training, including one, two sessions a week, can reduce hamstring muscle injury incident and severity in elite young soccer player. I will show you uh, the study. So as you can see in this uh, specific slide, you can see this paper published by the OIS 2015. And uh, this study uses a training frequency between one and two times a week. The inertia was quite high, so the moment of inertia was uh, 0.11. Uh, it is uh, quite heavy on the inertia, but if you want to have more volume adaptation, it's what you should use. And uh, in particular, you see two different exercises. One is a leg curl exercise, so we both leg, and a squat exercise. Uh, this is quite important because the populations were elite strength soccer players, so we know that training uh, can have an injury prevention effect in this type of population. So the study wasn't done on amateurs. So when you have elite strength soccer player, you, you know that you can transfer that to other uh, professional or at least elite population. So, uh, I added also in this case uh, three arrows uh, to show you the benefits that you generally have of the training, at least the report in this study. You can see that there is a reduction in uh, severity of injuries and improvement in contraband and performance. And in this case, you see there are some sprint improvements, but you have that not in uh, the first part of the sprint, but you have that uh, in the second part. So, from 0 to 10 and 0 to 20, there is not so much uh, improvement or the evidence is conflicting, so in this case they are likely. And uh, between 10 and 20, we have obviously uh, something that is a bit more uh, probable. So it is defined here as very likely. I, uh, I don't know, Olivia, if you know so much about statistics, but uh, I like statistics a lot. And this study has uh, say an issue that is about uh, the statistical analysis that has been done. Is, uh, this metric is called MBI. So we know that these data are a bit, uh, say, uh, um, weaker sometimes because we're using the traditional statistical approach, uh, unclear and likely mean non significant. But to let you know, anyway, if you watch this graphic, uh, severity injury, contemporary performance, and sprint, but from 10 to 20, uh, improved in the training group. Do we have only this evidence? In reality, we have something more. So, if you check this paper published by Panspray in 2003, that shows a 
repository that we use muscle injury, we can see that the protocol that is similar, not very different from the one done by the OIO, uh, you can have an improvement in um, uh, a reduction in uh, muscle injury, uh, likelihood of, in uh, using a flywheel like car. You see also that there are some improvements in the, the strength, so for example, big torque. Uh, this is a good point, and, but if you check that the most important part is at least show that you can reduce minor and moderate hamstring injury compared to the control. So, to summarize the, this evidence that we are doing this topic, your intervention in 2021, I wrote another paper titled Implementing Strength Training Strategy for Injury Prevention in Soccer. And uh, you can find that online. If you don't find that, that you may be, I can send the paper to you. Uh, so, this paper, as you can see on the right, found that flywheel training, if proposed twice a week with a volume of three to six steps and repetition six weight, can reduce the likelihood of muscle injury. Obviously, in this case, we are mainly talking about the heart injury. So, in the same paper, obviously, uh, this one is uh, the title as well with the author. So, I think we're going to go and Sergio, Anthony, and Chris. I wanted to show you some videos. So, the first video is uh, a leg curl exercise, and this is one. So, you can see that there is a concentric phase and after an eccentric phase. You will see the machine on the left, so you can see the, see the machine how it works. Uh, I'd say in this video, there is a, a, say, a limitation. Uh, the range of motion in all uh, full is quite short, but uh, this one was uh, one of the first videos that uh, we took in, in my lab. Uh, after we found some strategy to increase the range of motion, so I'd say we can add a 150 degree, 160 degree range of motion. Is uh, what uh, we would like to have. Uh, the second exercise uh, that is called hip extension is an exercise that is used also in this case in uh, injury prevention in uh, professional football. Uh, there is not so much research on that, but we are doing this research in this very moment uh, in, uh, in my lab, which will just submit one, one paper very soon. So this exercise works in the same way, but obviously um, uh, press the hamstring with a different angle and the different speed. Uh, this type of exercise is more similar to what happened during the uh, running activity, so especially high speed running. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that the major part of the injury are in uh, the bicep femoris, in the long head, and is in the proximal part of the, um, uh, the bicep. So this type of exercise uh, uh, goes to stimulate exactly that part of the muscle. So I want to show you this exercise for the last time. All right. So now I would like to come back uh, for a moment uh, to show this table that you can find the same paper that we published in front of this before. This table reports the advantages, limitation, and future direction of uh, um, flywheel training. I will not read the advantages because uh, I just discussed that, so we know that flywheel training and the change complex are very different from many things, but I would like to uh, highlight one limitation. So the limitation is the lack of standard procedure for exercise loading, prescription, and monitoring. And as you can see in this specific slide, we uh, highlight the necessity to use an encoder to evaluate power, velocity, and if you can compute force. So this is a limitation. So this type of limitation uh, guide us to the next part of our journey of this presentation that is about this paper titled Load Quantification and Testing Using the Lead Binary Sport. The paper has just been published in Frontiers Physiology in uh, August 28, 9, September 2021, so it's very, very recent, and it's the first paper that really tries to understand better how you can uh, evaluate flywheel exercises and how you can test flywheel exercises. Also, this paper can be found, like I said, in Frontiers. If you don't have the, the, the link or you don't find the paper, if you mail me, I will send you the link to the journal. So, in a second. All right. In this slide, you can find a positive velocity profile. This is specific for a gravity defined exercise. This is exactly the, the type of force velocity that you have with a traditional resistance frame. So on the top left of the picture, you can see 
that the force is high, but the velocity is low. Uh, is is what, uh, how we, we can expect in this type of condition, which is a, an adequate condition for the development of maximum strength. So if your movements are very demanding from a force point of view, but you are very close to uh, a velocity, uh, a zero velocity, you are close to your one line or isometric contraction. At the contrary on the other side of the profile, you have um, probably or more power or if you are already uh, in uh, the final part of the curve where you will have high velocity and low force um, production. So generally you have your peak power in the middle between um, obviously force and velocity because we know that power is the combination of the two. So using the exercise, size, it is possible to recreate exactly the same profile. But there is an important difference between graphic dependent exercise and value exercise. So the most important point is that in the intensity of resistance training programs has been traditionally prescribed using the maximum strength. So the percentage of your one RM. So the maximum weight that you can lift once. However, this is not possible with the flywheel demands because they are not target independent. So in some way, you cannot have a one RM with the flywheel devices. So the, the motivation for um, for this is uh, the motivation of this issue is because we uh, did a study with uh, another colleague of mine that we work in the same university where we evaluate the concentric and the concentric inertial velocity and inertial power relationship in flywheel squat. And uh, uh, the motivation of this, uh, the creation of this profile was exactly this one. We cannot have a one RM, so the only way to understand where we are from a power point of view or velocity point of view is using uh, this approach. So, before to show you this video that I prepared, I want to explain what happened during this exercise. So, during the exercise, the users needed to accelerate the inertia wheel of the device during the concentric phase which will return the stored energy during the following exchange phase of the exercise. During the breaking phase, the users, the participants, need to decelerate the flywheel and invert the movement actually to perform the concentric movement. An important note about the deceleration is that some specific breaking technique, you can find that in many papers, can be used to accentuate the effort in a specific part of the range of motion. But uh, this is uh, obviously something that I don't want to discuss today. So keep a look to the video one second. So you have a concentric phase, and after is a eccentric phase that is very demanding, uh, where the athlete needs to decelerate that and start again. So I want to show this again. So the concentric phase is when the athletes go up in the squat, the, the, the um, deceleration, the eccentric phase is when the athletes go down. Okay, with the, this type of machine we have an encoder, so we can recreate this type of profile. And now we we'll try to explain you uh, a bit of that. So, as you can see, flywheel exercise use all inertia loads that generate high velocity movement. And these movements were suggested favoring quick and explosive muscle related adaptation. Instead, the exercise is using higher inertia loads to generate lower velocity. As you can see that from obviously the, the graphic, and we're suggested to favor great force production and maximum strength. So it's clear from this profile that we change on the little inertia, and the movements are slower with a higher inertia, as you can see uh, obviously in, uh, in, the, in the slide. And if you want to read more, there is this paper uh, published by us. So that is very clear. So, uh, for example, in this picture, you have a 0 0.029 uh, moment of inertia. It is uh, relatively light uh, and the speed is higher compared to the, the other inertia load of 0 0.1221. Okay, so you see that the speed is higher. This happens also during the exchange phase, and it is, uh, is what we expect also with the traditional resistance exercise. But there is a difference when we evaluate power, as you can see, the two orange arrows. So, like I was saying, um, for mechanical power, uh, we know power is a combination of force and velocity. Uh, sometimes uh, the peak power is um, is uh, um, is not higher in the middle. Uh, 
uh, if you check the graph very well, you will see that the peak power probably is with a higher inertia, and in the middle you have sometimes a higher power or lower power, but it, there is not a nice curve as you can have with the traditional exercise. The motivation of that is that probably we struggle to find the peak power, the real peak power, because uh, when you change inertia, uh, it's very complicated to have a small variation of inertia load. So since uh, you modify the inertia with a disk, disk uh, sometimes you jump from 0.061 to 0.089. Probably this one is too much. And anyway, we know that anyway, power is a combination of force and velocity, so it could be that a movement that requires more force obviously is lower, but the power is exactly the same of a movement that is quicker but with low force. So this one is the limitation of using power uh, in uh, uh, for load quantification and testing with this type of design device, and we should acknowledge that. Why this is important? Because in daily practice, in reality, uh, power is the most common parameter. Everybody uses power. Or the second method is to use uh, the combination of disks. So you talk only about inertia. But we know from this paper that probably we should talk about uh, speed-based training when we evaluate the um, flywheel, uh, uh, flywheel exercises. So this is obviously what we know from a research point of view. However, in daily practice, this is what happens in daily practice. So, for example, strength training, clinical, or sport contest, the two most common parameters used to modulate any training, the load intensity, are moment of inertia, so your disk, the combination, and the power output. Also, if we know there is a limitation, this is the most common approach. And the paper reported here on the left is an example of that. So, it is a paper that I published with some colleagues from Barcelona Football Club. And, uh, there is uh, a particular, a particular uh, um, new metric that I want to present you because until now we discuss about concentric power and the eccentric power, and this is fine, okay? But what is the eccentric compared to what? In many papers, you will find that the flywheel device can be used to achieve an eccentric overload. So this means that the eccentric is more demanding than the concentric. You could be surprised, but not with the all the exercise you will have. So to evaluate this, you need to really uh, to state the eccentric overload. You need to evaluate the eccentric concentric pressure. Okay. So uh, this is very important because in daily practice people talk about the eccentric overload when they are not evaluated. So if you want to talk about the eccentric overload, you must evaluate your concentric eccentric power and the eccentric power need to be higher. In um, uh, the two exercises that I showed you before, so knee flexion uh, and uh, um, hip expansion. In reality, we found, for example, and we will publish very soon that, that the chip overload is not reached every time. You need to have the right combination of inertia. Frequently, the chip overload increases with the increment of the inertia. And the context, sometimes with the low inertia load, the concentric power is higher than the concentric. Okay. So we can move to the next study. And we change slightly topic now. So uh, let's talk about flywheel test. Currently, we don't have much evidence about this specific topic, but very recently we have developed in my lab in England a new flywheel squat test protocol aiming to evaluate muscle adaptation, so chronic adaptation, and also acute adaptation in sport, um, obviously in sport, but our topic, like I said, like, uh, the main output, like I, I told you before, have this limitation because of excessive mechanical power. But this is what the practitioner generally uses. So this type of uh, um, uh, test will give you a feedback, the output, the mechanical power. Be aware of the limitation, but uh, this is what generally the practitioner, uh, practitioner requires. So this protocol consists in three sets or six repetitions. Why three sets? Uh, three sets? Because uh, we needed a reliability between sets. Six repetitions are needed because uh, framework device quite unreliable when you evaluate one or two repetitions, so you must have at least six repetitions. And the moment of inertia was 0.06, that is quite heavy, but not extremely heavy. So plus or minus all participants could use this type of inertia. Obviously, if you are training maybe a very strong uh, professional athlete uh, in football or 
in rugby, sport where uh, these athletes have a lot of power, probably you can increase the energy a little bit, but for professional football, I think 0.06 is the right combination. So, uh, what is about what, what about the reliability of this test? We know that the test test reliability for both concentric and concentric power output was very good. So the ICC was 0.94, 0.95, as you can see in this slide. In this slide, this was about the reliability. What about uh, the validity? So we found a significant linear relationship between isokinetic concentric and eccentric parameters and the concentric eccentric parameter reported in this uh, specific test. So we know that the uh, MILEX, so the isokinetic device, is generally the gold standard for evaluating force in your quadriceps and hamstring, and we found that the trigger size, the two tests, are well correlated. So there is a significant correlation. Moreover, if you check the coefficient of variation for conventional variability, the coefficient of variation is quite similar to uh, the isokinetic test. So it means that if you need to use a quick test that is not gold standard uh, and you want a result that is a bit more specific than the isokinetic test, you can evaluate your concentric and eccentric uh, uh, exercise with the flywheel squat test. So, if you're interested in this argument, the study report in this slide can be found in the Journal of Sports Science and was published in 2020. Uh, since I know it's sometimes it's difficult to download the paper, if you may be able to send also uh, this paper later on. So, uh, I would like to move to the final part of this presentation because I'm sure you are a bit tired. Uh, so, um, we know that flywheel training is supported in several scientific studies. We have seen that in the presentation, but there are limitation about the information uh, about periodization. So therefore, the aim of this article, you can see here, uh, is to uh, explain you what are the methodological um, um, characteristics of periodization when we talk about uh, this part of the periodization related to uh, to uh, So. What we know about periodization, so traditional periodization uh, generally considers two key aspects of uh, performance development. The first one is the, the training load. So if you think of the studies I just explained, and we should try to understand the right combination of intensity, volume, and uh, training frequency to use during the session. The second aspect is about the calendar. So a microcycle is one week of training, a mesocycle is a combination of microcycles, and after a macrocycle is a combination of mesocycles. So on the base of the period, you know what are the strength, quality to train, for example, maximum strength, power, okay? Or, for example, you know also what are the characteristics of the training program based on the time that you have, because sometimes you need to have some training variation, uh, and also you can have a, a lower training frequency during the week because there are some games. So uh, I will try to show you a specific example of microcycle. In this case, we have a microcycle for a handball team in pre-season, so before the official season. Uh, during the pre-season, uh, we have generally one competition per week in handball. Uh, that happens generally also in football, and uh, generally, since there is one match and the other season, two training sessions per week for, to improve chronic, uh, to have chronic adaptation are generally recommended based on the literature. So we know that, that in the match days, minus four, you should have a focus on injury prevention and strength development using multi-set exercise and high load. So on the match days, minus four, far from the friendly match, high intensity. During the second session, match day is minus two, you can have a focus on power development using this time lower energy because we know that the changes demand are higher with high energy. So in this case, it's better to uh, have uh, a bit lower uh, demand. Uh, in this second table, there is an example of in season, different in season with the program for a professional soccer team. So one match per week which is uh, characterized by a subdivision of the, the, the group in two uh, small teams. So think that when you play in this you have the starters, the player that play the match, and generally the non-starter play, a player that don't play or play just a bit. So the training must be differentiated in this case. So on the match days, plus two, okay, 48 hours after the match, 
generally is recommended to work with the non starter because they need to compensate what they lost during the match, and you can try to have a um, training load that is quite high. So high match, high volume, and you don't you don't need to be worried about artisan foot bombs or uh, muscle shortness because you are part from the next match. It also the player needs to be trained. But as I say, the starter cannot train that day, so you need to wait under 24 hours. So on match days Monday sport, 72 hours after the match, starter should be ready to perform a intense pelvic training session. While non starter has just done the training session before, so they cannot repeat the same. So you need to change that in a power focus on power session. Okay? Another particular thing that is quite nice about this paper is that we introduced for the, for the first time the concept of micro dose. So on match days minus two, uh, you can have a micro dose of training, of like training with both groups, but this time maybe you have one set per exercise with focus on power because you are very close to the match. But this micro dose of training is for you to have a 10 session for the uh, non starter and one a half session for the starter that can be very useful to improve long term um, your, your performance. Uh, about that, uh, I want also to discuss about the concept of one session a week. So in this specific paper that we're published in Biology of Sport in 2019, you can see that uh, with only one session a week, we can have some improvement in uh, um, sport-specific uh, performance parameter in, uh, in football. So the ball we used in this specific case was demanding six sets at six sets of eight repetitions with a very heavy action, 0 0.11, uh, and we had that on the match days minus four. And uh, we compared uh, half of the team with the traditional uh, using the traditional training against the half of the team with the traditional resistant training using 80% of the one RM. And uh, what we have found in this specific case is that uh, plyometric training generally is better, more suitable to improve change of direction performance and short shuttle run. So as you can see in here, the two um, um, blue arrow. You have the first group that is called a chain break negative uh, training uh, that improve uh, um, the 20 plus 20 meter shuttle run and agility test. Uh, at the contrary, in this case, second slide, you will see that both group improve uh, squat performance, quadriceps strength, but generally, pre-week uh, training is better than traditional resistant training, whereby we improve quadriceps and chain break strength. Obviously, there is a, a, a transfer between plyometric training and eccentric performance. Anyway, traditional resistant training is suitable to improve performance, but improve a little better to level squat, uh, squat performance, 1 RM, and this concentric uh, strength. This is the problem. So, we are very close to finish, guys. Give me only a second. Uh, here, we have okay, another study that was a randomized trial. Uh, in uh, uh, player. Uh, in this case, you can see the presentation on the right. You see that we did the test in week zero and test in week nine, and we had four blocks of training from week one to week eight. In this specific case, what we have seen, we have seen that uh, changing that training every two weeks can be suitable to improve performance. And here we have the table with the exercises. As you can see in this specific case, we use a traditional linear periodization. This is maybe is not the most common approach to use, to use in, uh, in sport, but we have done that because uh, we knew that uh, with the spectrometer that could be that could be done. Uh, so as you can see, the volume decreases with time from stage one to stage four, or from week one to week eight. The RP was uh, the method to use with with intensity increased from level six to level nine. These exercises were the same between the groups, so we compare isolation for with training versus cable resistant groups. Same exercise, same form, same intensity. Obviously, the difference were the two exercises. What we found? We found that uh, uh, both training methods can improve athletic performance, in particular, change of direction. Okay? Both methods, unfortunately, do not improve linear sprint. Coming back to the original literature, if you remember, I told you that change of direction. Performance can improve sprint performance. We are not sure 100%. But 
but the depth is not only about the trend. That is also about the transitional resistance trend. Probably the motivational bet of that is because this type of athlete, a handball player, football player, sprinter during their transitional football trend. So it's difficult to increase the performance more than that. All right. So we are very, very close to finishing. I wanted to show you a, a thing that maybe you have never seen before, and is a parallelization about uh, um, uh, in, 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 in basketball when you have a congested fixed period. With congested fixed period, which is a, a huge problem in professional sport now, uh, you have many matches during the week, so there is not so much for training. So, in this specific case, what we recommend to the practitioner? to uh, encourage uh, the player to have a single session focus on power training and uh, if there is an opportunity to have a micro dose of training in the match there is uh, minus two. All right? So we have this situation where you have match, match this plus one, the journey is for recovery, match this minus two, so when you, you see that the week is very short, power training because you are already 24 hours, 48 hours from the match, after the match day, what can you do? Micro dose of pleasure uh, training. Why a micro dose? First point, you don't have time to, to recover. <laughs> and so you don't have the 48 hours for um, recovery after the match. So the players are quite tired, but you have 48 hours for the next match. So everybody probably can do a micro dose of pleasure training. Maybe if the player, the play, the starter are tired, you avoid that, but the no starter should do a bit of training, but not so much. So I want to conclude this presentation with a brief summary. The first article that you can see here, uh, that has been uh, just been published in for this, reports the background and rationale of the use of labor resources in sport, starting from the first preliminary studies to the last evidence about loop monitoring and testing using the device. This study reports also that inertia power and inertia, inertia velocity are relationship to this profile can be used to design uh, playability training. The second paper, as you have seen in this, in this presentation, has analyzed the most recent evidence and summarized some of the characteristics of strength and periodization. In detail, we have discussed how you can manipulate playability training in pre-season, in-season, and during a microcycle of congested fixture um, in professional sport. So, what else? We know also that the optimal inertia load can be assessed using a progressive test protocol to create this power profile. And uh, uh, this uh, individual uh, profile should be used to individualize training because each of these is a bit different, so we can use the same approach for everybody. Lastly, previous sport test protocol developed in our article in the Journal of Sports Science validate, has been validated in this study reporting excellent test and test readability. So you can use this specific test uh, in your lab or with your athlete. Uh, last point that uh, is more a acknowledgement. Uh, these two papers are in this special issue uh, in Protest Physiology titled The Science of Training Associated Physiology and Practical Application. And uh, I'm uh, one of the editors of this specific uh, um, special issue. And I would like to uh, acknowledge the efforts of the other authors, uh, the other editors, so Jose, Sergio, and uh, Javier. So thank you very much for this, for this for your attention to my presentation. Thank you so much for possibly this invitation and sorry for the first maybe 10 minutes because I had a technical issue. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for this presentation. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, if you have any question uh, for this paper, <coughs> you have any question for a person online? Or? No, for this online, but if I have one. Okay, I will finish. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. So, overall,
So I have to say, um, when you talk about reliability and validity, you know that uh, one of the main main point is, uh, especially when you talk about reliability, is the familiarization. So you should familiarize your athlete before you start to monitoring uh, them with uh, obviously the encoder. Uh, you know that the first two three weeks, the power output uh, and also the post production maybe are lower and also are a bit inconsistent. So my suggestion is that for the first two three session. Uh, this part of um, this part of the training protocol will be about familiarization. So spend time to improve the technique and to explain very well the uh, biomechanics of the exercise. That will increase the long term uh, the uh, power output post production, but also uh, the data will be more consistent, more reliable. Uh, we have seen that generally three sessions are enough to have that. Saying before, many studies also, and studies are done in our lab, which have asked for three sessions. That is what generally is recommended in the literature. We have seen this uh, inter subject variability. So, you could have a fleet with a background in strength training that will improve very quickly and probably maybe a couple of sessions are enough because obviously they are accustomed to uh, weight, uh, to, to lift some weight, okay? So, with the traditional barbells so or free weight. Uh, a different thing is for people that have never been in the gym. We have seen that people that have never been in the gym, when they uh, try to work with the flywheel exercise, they really struggle. So maybe they need a bit more time. But probably you have the same issue if you take someone that has never done strength training and you ask them to, to perform uh, Olympic lift or, or also a squat with a constant load. So I think it's something that we have in any sport. So familiarization is an issue, but until the point, you have that in any sport and in any um, uh, exercise that you have in the gym. So think about uh, um, power clean, power jerk, Olympic weight lift. Yeah. They are much more uh, unreliable compared to flight weight training because the technique for this type of exercise is much, much higher. Um, so from a biomechanics point of view, it's very complicated to be uh, to, to, to be readable in this type of exercise. As uh, so week training is, uh, say, in the beginning, after three weeks, uh, probably your training will be fine. Yeah, that's clear. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Omar, for your question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Marco Guido, for uh, this response. If there is any other thank question, you. Mark, thank you for your presentation. Just a question. I haven't seen any paper about sliding in arm exercise. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. maybe, I, maybe I missed some. But I don't know. There, there, there are some papers uh, that show that. Uh, they were not included in my presentation because they loved it. My, my focus has been mainly on the lower part of the body, so lower limbs. Uh, with, um, if you open the motion check line, you will see a lot of videos about the height of, uh, of the body. Uh, the, I think the main motivation, because you don't find many paper uh, on lower limbs, uh, on higher limbs, sorry, is because uh, uh, there is much more interest in injury prevention in the lower limbs in sport, uh, for example, football, and also because in uh, football like uh, rugby or this type of uh, uh, sport, uh, for me, the most important muscle are, I'd say, uh, the lower limbs. Uh, only um, this doesn't mean that you don't have to train the high part of the body, but um, probably uh, there, there is a bit less interest. That's probably the, the real motivation. In, uh, in the systematic review that they publish on technical uh, uh, fields, uh, you will see that there is nothing for the high part of the body, but not so much. So probably in the research in the future should be focused also on this. Okay, thank you very so much again, uh, Mr. Marco Vito for your presentation and uh, we are very happy to see your presentation and uh, have, a, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Great, Omar. A lot of more work than that. This, it seems that this constraint cannot influence significantly uh, the locomotor demand. So it means that uh, at, at this level, the total distance cover will be similar from match to match. This is one of the ways to look into the, the problem, but total distance is still uh, a more 
athletes. So they will adjust and regulate their behavior uh, based on the information that he, that they can collect from the match. So in this way, it's probably uh, one of the explanations why uh, many, many uh, locomotor demands are variable from scenario to scenario to match to match. So it's not, uh, we, we are, the ball. 
two, three, or four, or more uh, uh, planes formation across the time in that single map. So probably methodological approach can bias this information in the uh, ultimate level. So probably formation uh, uh, and somewhat scientific evidence is not the best approach to uh, explain uh, the ultimate uh, variation in locomotor uh, locomotor in a diamond but uh, but probably we can use some kind of information about model of play so in in this case the term uh, model of play means how players behave and interact based on specific uh, guides or rules imposed by coach but how can they behave during the match in different scenarios and different contexts so in this study uh, the, the group of Daniel Lemaire uh, uh, tested the impact of di two different uh, defensive approaches to match one defensive approach was the deep defending while the, the other was a high press uh, defending and we can see here what, me what it means deep defending that is defending, defending closer to uh, uh, of our uh, role while uh, high pressure defending is more uh, pressing forward more closer of the opponent's role and it was quite interesting to see that collective dynamics were clearly different from uh, these two types of uh, defensive uh, pressure. Uh, we saw that in high pressure, uh, the, the distance between, between, uh, between teams were uh, closer, while we also uh, shorter ball, ball possession times for the teams in case of high pressure defending or facing uh, high pressure defending. So also in high pressure it was uh, observed larger dispersion in defending team in large individual areas for opponent attacking. So it means that uh, the model of play and uh, the way how we can interact together as a team to face a given uh, scenario uh, can play this, in this case, a specific uh, uh, difference in the big difference in the collective dynamics. So, in this collective dynamics, probably can explain some variation in terms of lo locomotor uh, uh, dynamics. So, also in this uh, study, it was observed uh, uh, that two two different uh, different things. In the case when playing against a def a deep defending, more spaces were made in the midfield, midfield third. You can see here that more spaces against this deep defending, uh, more spaces occur here in the middle of the field. While uh, playing against this high pressure defending, the, the focus of the team with ball possession was trying to move the ball for a goalkeeper and then probably put the, the ball uh, firmer uh, to, to reduce the, the risk for uh, taking a counter-attack. So, trying to combine also information about the uh, physical demands and the uh, uh, collective dynamics this study conducted by Bruno Gonçalves and Daniel Scholli uh, tested an hypothesis uh, uh, about uh, diff uh, three different uh, tasks on train while using a, a large size of game. So they have tested a restricted area against a contiguous area and against a free play. So trying to compare the, the collective dynamics and the physical demands imposed by these uh, three different task constraints, it was found that the peak restriction decreased the, spa uh, the spatial exploration index, showing that players covered less space during the, these uh, situations, so restricting uh, restricted and con contiguous lead or conducted to decreases in the exploration of the field and also significantly decrease the, the running intensity of, uh, of players. So uh, there was an increase in the walking distance in, in those scenarios. So 
might be able to fix otherwise we can have or we can face some issues regarding the evidence that we can provide so possibly uh, in the near future we will have instruments with a higher precision and this can uh, provide us more trustable information about the variability of high intensity uh, variables that then that, that then are converted in big mass demands. But in terms of uh, approaches, probably the, the discrete one that was presented uh, uh, early in this presentation, I will just try to put the article. Uh, sorry. This one, probably discrete uh, approach is more appropriate than rolling averages. Uh, although no substan substantial information regarding the, the, the comparison between rolling averages and discrete time uh, has been uh, produced uh, in uh, a substantial level. So more research is needed uh, for determining the best approach. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Is there any, any question? Yes, uh, uh, Professor. Thank you, uh, sir, for this presentation. Uh, welcome uh, once in uh, to our Congress. So my question is about, uh, you are talking about uh, te uh, technology in sport, I think, no? So uh, how yeah. technology can change or modulate uh, tactical behavior for players? Well, this is a tricky question and a yeah. good one uh, uh, because Probably in the future we can use uh, better the technology to identify the collective dynamics and patterns and then using this uh, technology for uh, uh, making faster decisions in our players. One of the examples is to use, let's see, the uh, augmented reality. So augmented reality means that you will have virtual real reality and also the real uh, scenario. You can see uh, information in your glasses and make the decision faster. This is one of the ways to uh, improve information in making faster uh, 
arbitrary. But probably you can use the virtual uh, reality for uh, preparing your players for virtual scenarios, uh, like uh, experiencing some the dynamics of play. So this is one of the ways that we can use for improving uh, and use technology and taking advantage of technology. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, perfect example can be use positional data information for improving and combined with machine learning for improving understanding about uh, data analytics and uh, probability for using this player and not the other player for a specific match or for a specific scenario. So technology can change a little bit the ultimate performance, can uh, possibly can save players for, from uh, risk situations and probably can prepare players for uh, having a better performance. But th these are speculations for the next uh, coming years. Thank you, thank you, Doctor, for uh, your answer and for uh, your very nice and good uh, presentation. We, the next presentation, uh, Doctor Hamza, uh, we will introduce uh, Doctor Stefan Altman from Karlsruhe, from, from Germany. Thank you, uh, thank you, Philip. You can stay with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very and, much. Uh, Congratulations for this uh, for, uh, for this comment. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, Altman Stefan is there. How are you? I'm very fine. Hello. 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 I'm ready. I'm, yeah. Hello. So uh, the next uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Uh, Stefan Altman from uh, City of Sports Sciences. Karachi Institute of uh, Technology. Uh, our uh, celebration is about the sports and this is the, uh, excuse me, uh, testing and training agility in team sports athletes, I think. So uh, I give the, the floor. Stay yours. Yeah, you have about one hour. Today, um, when I say team sports, with that term I mean a whole bunch of different kinds of sports, including soccer, handball, basketball, different types of rugby or football codes. So quite a whole bunch of different types of team sports. At first, I might want to give some background regarding agility in general. So what is agility and why is it important for us?
museum, you can see that all the plants, all the runs are before they get into the pad. So it's a plant scenario. <coughs> Spreadsheets are these kind of plant scenarios. What we have in different types of dashboards, and I would ask you know that's not really specific because usually you don't you don't plan that you will do a sprint now or that you will conduct a change of direction, but instead we have to react to a spot-specific stimulus. And this is um, what the second video shows. And this is a video um, which shows uh, a scene from a match and it's from 2018, the Soccer World Cup, in the match between France and Argentina. And there are some, in my opinion, really cool scenes which show how Kylian and Mbappé um, does some really uh, agility-like actions during the, during the game. In this moment, Argentina has the ball on the right side of the pitch, and, and Mbappé has the number 10 here in the middle of the pitch, and we'll just have a look at what happens now. skills with the ball, so he's faster than most of the people on the pitch. A big difference between these two actions is that the, uh, the one on the left side is pre-planned and the one on the right side is open, it's not so planned ahead. And this is what agility constitutes mainly in two components. The first component is um, the retrograde movement, the change of, of velocity or direction, which you could see on the left side. But it also includes, besides the physical co component, a rather perceptual cognitive component, which is the response to stimulus. So left side, change of direction, and right side, a combination of both change of direction and perceptual and cognitive skills, in this case, the response to stimulus. aspects that I just introduced. Um, on the left side, the perceptual decision-making factors, and on the right side... With the technology, they try to prove that the engineers, the data scientists, the sports scientists, and the scouts maybe, they try to improve the technology that we're having, and eventually, then we can improve the functionality of these devices, so we get them gradually, we get them better, and then, at the end of the day, we get them to uh, what the Gartner Hype Cycle calls the plateau of productivity. So this is where technologies are then usually functionable and let's say they can be used by non-technical experts, so not by the engineers, data scientists, but let's say in our case, the more yeah, practical-oriented coaches or athletes or the wider public. So with this model in mind, which of course has some, some drawbacks or some yeah, false claims in it, but with this model in mind, of course, I believe, no, your question could be, yeah, Peter Brain, I know, I know this model, but the question is, how good is a certain technology? What parameters can we test now? And which parameters are, let's say, some of them with the plateau of productivity, which are maybe at the peak of inflated expectations, and where we are maybe also just on the technological trigger. And this is what I would like to show you in the next slides. So I would like to show you my view on how ready a certain technology is to monitor a specific parameter in the field of sports. So, and this is just, just my perspective. And on the right side, we have parameters which I think can commercially be functional. So, on this plateau of productivity. And the further we go to the left, of course, the more you get to the stages 
of the slope of the lightning or even on the peak of invective or um, latent expectations. And on the right side, we have parameters such as acceleration and heart rate, which are functional, I guess, these days in most instances. And on the left, we have parameters such as sweat loss or intake of micro or macro nutrients. And please note that these stages of technological readiness are not discrete, but rather fluid. So there's change in those parameters very, very often, depending on how often new products are released in the market. And also, the strap is not meant to be specifically designed to exactly judge where specific parameters exactly located in every situation for every person. But I guess this somewhat gives you a brief overview, okay, what parameters can you measure with confidence in many instances, and with which parameters you should be a little bit more cautious in general. Having said that, I would like to deep dive into that graph and into some specific parameters a little bit deeper with you and to explain maybe a little bit also how I come to this view on how ready a certain technology is and to explain to you, okay, with maybe as an athlete or coach, how do you deal with certain data, how you select certain data, which then can improve your decision making or inform your decision making when it comes to guiding athletes training. So, as I said, I will pick some parameters out of this graph and explain them a little bit better to you and, and yeah, just to show them to you a little bit deeper. And maybe one parameter which is quite interesting, at least from my perspective, because a lot of athletes or coaches know about it, is the maximum oxygen uptake, BO2 peak or BO2 max. And we have in the market now smartwatches which can which claim to measure this parameter. So of course, I believe many of you know we can measure oxygen uptake by the breath by breath deep breathing gas analyzers. So from the cortexes or the cosmets in this world. We were interested because I mean we all have different smartwatches maybe on our wrist. We were interested, okay, they show him what kind of oxygen uptake you're having without analyzing breathing gas. We were just interested in our own lab, okay, how accurate are these devices to measure peak oxygen uptake. So um, just just last year we, we took the, the Garmin 4Runner 245, which was at that time the flagship model of Garmin, and we used it as instructed by the manufacturer. We compared, okay, what are the results that the smartwatch is giving us for the VO2 peak for the oxygen uptake? We compared that to criteria measure, to the breathing gas analyzer, to the Vortex Medimax 3B. And I would like to show you on the next slides the results. So how good is VO2 peak? measurement by the smartwatch actually compared to criterion measurement. And when evaluating our results, we revealed that over the parameter range of 38 to 61 milliliters per minute per kilogram, the mean absolute percentage error of the smartwatch compared to the criterion measure was 5.7%. So it's roughly 2.8 milliliters per minute per kilogram. And while the literature is not providing cutoffs, if this percentage error is acceptable, good or bad, I'd say 5.7%, that's not too bad for, for many instances, for many athletes. However, I would like to point out something else as well. In the figure on the right, you can see the blend outcome plot of our results section. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the blend outcome plots. So on the x-axis, we have the mean oxygen uptake values, and on the y-axis, we have the difference between the values of the smartwatch and the criteria measure. And this graph reveals a trend in the results in the data. And it appears that with lower real VO2P values, the smartwatch somewhat tends to overestimate the VO2P values compared to the breathing gas analyzer. Whereas when we come more to the higher values, the smartwatch tends to underestimate the, the real VO2P. So, there is a trend in the data and we need to be cautious what happens maybe when we add more extreme values, maybe the trend decreases and then we get different error rate. So I'd like to point out that we need to be a little bit cautious with these devices still. So I guess the key message is, until here, mean absolute percentage error between the smartwatch and uh, the Garmin smartwatch, in that case, the criteria, which is 5.7%, which 
might be not too bad in many instances. But I guess you must also say that you must be more cautious. The more extreme values of VOTP we are getting, the more extreme or the more we get away from these 38 to 61 milliliters per minute per kilogram in our athletes. And this is what I would like to point out, what I would like to highlight here for you. Even though for a certain parameter range, the wearable might provide a certain error range, this doesn't mean that in other situations, in other populations, in other value ranges, the error is the same. Or in a, I would like to, to make you aware of that. Just be cautious, just closely look at the validation studies and look for, okay, what parameter range did the authors actually validate and look for? And depending if you have an athlete in the same parameter range, you might need to be a little bit more cautious, kind of necessarily extrapolate the results you receive from, let's say, these studies. So just as a first key take home message. But maybe shifting the focus a little bit away from smart watches and VOTP, because I believe there are other or interesting parameters we can measure now with variables. And I believe one parameter which is receiving a lot of attention at the moment is basically glucose. How can we measure continuously, or how can we measure continuously uh, blood glucose, or more specifically, interstitial glucose concentration with a smart patch? So there are patches, you might have seen them out there, uh, available, which were developed for type B patients, which you can apply on your on your arm. And but the question is, how valid are they? I mean, they're developed for diabetic patients, so <coughs> they should be comparatively valid. But the question is, how valid are they, for example, in sports? How valid are they when we exercise? Because maybe that's when athletes or coaches are the most interested in glucose concentrations. So, and I'd like to highlight one study which was performed or recently just published in the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance. And there the authors compare, okay, how valid is the patch which measures interstitial glucose compared to, yeah, more, more criteria measures such as the fingerprint measurements. And the results revealed that basically what you can see in the graph, depending on the intensity you're exercising it or depending on what you're doing at the moment, the validity, the trustworthiness, maybe so to speak, of the device differs dramatically. So, for example, in this graph we have the, the x-axis of the different yeah, testing conditions, and on the y-axis we have the glycemia. So the authors in this case were interested in post-breakfast and uh, pre-exercise, and then they let the athletes perform a high-intensity interval training, and then they yeah, measured, of course, also post-exercise. And I guess it gets quite clear. I mean, this is the measurements we receive from the smart patch and the other graph is showing the measurements from the fingerprints and from the criteria measure. And while the error rates and the difference between the smart patch and the fingerprint is post breakfast 9.4%, which might be acceptable in some instances, but the error of the smart patch compared to the fingerprint increases during intermittent exercise to 16.2%. And just for my feeling, that's a high error. So maybe you can use the glucose monitor the smart pitch, which you can apply to your upper arm during resting conditions of post breakfast. Maybe in some instances, 9.4% error rate. Maybe that's OK. But 16.2% error rate during exercise, I would say in many instances, this using that data will lead us to wrong decisions. So I'd say we cannot guide athletes or coaches on an error rate of 16.2%. So using that data is simply not valid in that instance as shown by this by this publication. So basing a decision on non-valid data, I would likely not recommend that. So to give you also there the, the key messages regarding interstitial glucose concentration, I guess the key take home messages you will be the validity is a higher at rest but it's definitely compromised during intermittent exercise. So I would just like to, to make coaches aware that depending on the exercise during which you would like to monitor a parameter, 
the validity can differ. And when you want to select data and guide your decision, make sure you are using it, which is delivering valid data to the instances you would like to measure that parameter. So it's not just the parameter range, for example, as seen with the VOTP measurements, but it's also the intensity you are using a certain device in which matters when it comes to selecting the right data. So just keep that in mind as well. So, and as a last example, I would like to highlight another parameter which we can measure continuously nowadays with uh, wearable devices because of blood pressure. So uh, we, or at least some companies, have developed technology which can measure blood pressure and your, and your risk. So you do not need the cough anymore, which is, can be perceived as inconvenient by many people. So you simply wear a device like your smartwatch and it uses PPG, so optical sensors, to monitor blood pressure. So I said we do not need to cough anymore. You can simply wear the device as a smartwatch and basically forget about it. And this is a class two medical device, so there is validity of the devices. And the error rate, that's very small, which is also why you receive class two medical grade. So and during sitting in the population of 21 to 65 years of age, in men and women, the error rate of systolic blood pressure is, let's say, only 0 0.46 millimeters mercury. Diastolic blood pressure is only 9.39 millimeters mercury. So that's numerically accurate. As said, this is a medical grade device. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we can say that this error rate is, is acceptable. Um, but what I would like to highlight here as well is that the device is not validated for individuals above the age of 65 years of age. So again, depending on the population you would like to monitor, maybe the parameter can be monitored, maybe not. And also, the device is not validated, and it's likely also not intended for that, but the device can also, or it's, it's at least not validated during sports. So be cautious simply because you have maybe a medical device, which is a device which is certified as a medical device. Doesn't mean that you can automatically apply it with your athletes and that you can automatically use it to, to guide a certain training. So just be, be aware of that too. So but to summarize a little bit this, this first part of my, my talk. Uh, what I tried to highlight with this example is that evaluating the technological readiness for the validity of a wearable for a specific situation, for a specific parameter, for a specific population, that's not easy. Even for experts, that's not easy. And even though we have more and more validations that is available, for example, on the left you see a picture where I extract the numbers of publications listed in the PubMed database about validity of wearables. Selecting the right wearable is not made easier by that. And while we think, or what I think, validation studies are definitely needed and increasing yeah, dramatically. So, for example, in the 1990s, we basically had no validation studies. And now, each year, we have 600 validation studies and, and wearables. I think it's not necessarily more easy to select a yeah, specific device because it really depends on the parameter of the population and on the situation you would like to measure. And this would be my, my first key take-home messages, maybe, or what, what I would like you to remember from, from this talk. I would like to sensitize you and ask the coaches, people working with athletes and coaches, be aware that a wearable can only aid you during the decision-making process if the data it provides is really valid. If the wearable delivers valid data, often depends on your specific problem, on your specific use case. When do you want to monitor a parameter? With, with which athletes you would like to monitor the parameter? When does it really matter to you? And then check, okay, if you have that clear, what's your problem? When do you want to monitor a parameter? Only then go out and check if a wearable is suitable to monitor that parameter and then can really inform you if you should guide your training like that. So, but coming from that aspect, I think 
we should shift our focus a little bit to talk a lot about data and about validity of data. And but I'd like to, to shift the focus a little bit from the lower levels of this pyramid, maybe to the yeah, to the upper level, to the decision we can make with the wearable. What happens if we collect reliable our data? What happens if we have sufficient information, insights, and judgment criteria in order to come to a decision based on the data? Is this then helpful for coaches to guide in that individual's training? Is this possible? And now these, these are the questions I would basically like to uh, elaborate with you a little bit. So what happens if we have reliable, if we have valid data, if we have all the information, all the insights, all the judgments we can make to come to a decision? The question is, okay, is the decision I can make with the data then better <laughs> as I would not have the data then? Because only then if the decision is better than no data, I should do all this data collection and information gathering, inside judgment, and so on. And as an example, I'd like to pick one parameter. I'd like to, to pick the heart rate variability as an example. And in the following, I'd like to give you some physiological insights into heart rate variability, and then tell you okay, how it might be used to decide what training you can do based on the data if there is scientific evidence for that parameter that can scientifically, evidently show that it uses or, or aids you in finding a decision to guide training. But let's start with the phys physiological background first. So as many of you like to know, your heart rate is not completely regular, but there is variability between each heartbeat, and we can see that on the on the graphs here on the left. I tried to showcase it there a little bit abstractly to you. And depending on how much variability there is, we can say you are more stressed or maybe you are a little bit less stressed. And frankly speaking, if your heart rate variability is high, so your heart beats a little bit like the upper graph here, we can say that you are less stressed. And if your heart rate variability is high, this could indicate that your that your stress, that your training load maybe is is high. So if your heart is more regular, then it means you're stressed and you might have the need to, to recover. So depending on the on the heart rate variability, you might can say, okay, your heart beats comparably variable for you. This might indicate okay, you're ready to perform, you're ready to train, or as your heart beats more regular. Maybe you are experiencing an increase in load and maybe you should take some time to recover. So we might have something here like a gas pedal and a braking pedal. This could be our gas pedal, okay, if our heart beats is more regular or irregular, you can go like that. Then we have the gas pedal, we can speed up, we can do more training maybe, and if our heart beats more like that, maybe there could be something like a, like a braking pedal. And maybe we should then reduce the amount of training we're doing. And how you can use the heart rate variability in practice to control training processes. I would like to show you with this diagram how you can use this uh, gas in a braking pedal, maybe. So on the x axis, you have the time, and we started with a, with a baseline period, so a period of no training, and then we have a training period here, which are shown by the arrows. And on the y-axis, we have the heart rate variability of one, one athlete. And on the graph, you basically see each dot is a morning measurement of, of that individual athlete. So, and when each dot is one measurement, the black line which goes through the dots, that's then the rolling average. So basically this was, in this case, the three-day rolling average to yeah, get some, get rid of some, some noise in the data. And as I said, on the left we have no training days, and on the right we have training days. And what we need to do is we need to firstly understand you as an individual. We need to understand what's your normal variability of your heart. What is normal for you? What is your normal heart rate variability variance? So this is then showcased by the, by the gray corridor. That's your uh, 
usual variability in your, your usual variance in your heart rate variability. And when we have established for each individual that corridor, what is a normal stress level as indicated by your heart rate variability, we can then say, okay, when you go out of your individual corridor, we have then the gas or the braking pedal. We can then say, okay, no, you're more stressed than usual, or you maybe also less stressed than usual. So this is what you can see on the, on the graph. Basically, when your heart rate variability drops outside of the corridor, so goes below the parameter range usual corridor. Yeah, maybe that's not great. Yeah, maybe that's not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One, uh, one minute more. One, one minute more. Good. Then you should basically yeah decrease the training load, and when you decrease the training load, of course the stress reduces. And the question is, what happens if we apply that procedure? And together with Richard Belsi from the High Institute of Sex, we performed the meta analysis on that, and we could basically reveal that when we use the gas and the braking pedal, and when we compare that training to a predefined training, so a training which a coach would usually design, we could reveal that, okay, we're doing less training, at least 55% of the interventions which we use in our meta analysis use fewer uh, uh, training sessions, but at the same time, we increased, we showed small positive effects in peak performance and VO2 peak, and also moderate effect on sub maximum parameters. And to us, this was astonishing. Okay, while we do less training, we have the same or even better results on our upcoming variants. And to me, this is actually doing less, but we maybe do more smart training, and we can get better results than what we would do when a coach would define our training. So when we have a parameter, we can monitor reliably and valid and if we interpret it correctly and apply it correctly i'd say okay we can base a decision on that data which informs our training which improves our training which yeah improves the outcomes the performance of our athletes having said that also some some words of caution of course uh, i wouldn't say that everybody now should use heart rate variability there are still a lot of unsolved questions so and especially when it comes to recreation of athletes, we haven't really figured out, okay, how much variance you should have in your heart rate variability, when you should use the brake, let's say, when you should speed up. And we should also say, okay, only in a controlled environment, your heart rate variability, of course, drops because of the uh, training load. But heart rate variability can be altered by a lot of parameters, let's say bad sleep or alcohol intake or too much nutrients before you go to sleep. So, too much fatty food before we go to sleep. So heart rate variability needs to be integrated into context. So be cautious with that parameter, please. But I'd say, okay, we, or to summarize my talk, maybe, maybe that 30 seconds I have left, um, I think when it comes to variables, be aware that not all data points are valid, what you can measure and base a decision on it and think about, okay, yeah, do I really have valid data for my wearable? But I think I could also showcase in the last minutes that when we use a parameter which we can pick up reliably and valid, that there is a tendency or some evidence that, that can really inform your training procedure. And it appears that there might be some beneficial effects compared to predefined training. With this, I'd like to thank once again the, the organizers for uh, inviting me to this session. Sorry for being a little bit over time, uh, but if you have maybe a few questions, I'm happy to, to answer them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this excellent uh, uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Peter. Dr. Peter. Uh, I have a, a, a question about. Um, other technology to explore the behavior, the ACE behavior, and to support decision making by using, uh, for example, the mobile eye. Uh, sorry, the, uh, I missed the last word. Can yeah, the, by using by using the mobile mobile eye. The the mobile eye. Yeah. 
to to yeah. to explore the 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 behavior of uh, the behavior of A's and to uh, to support the decision making. Yes, I I think you have we, idea. We have really solve that that issue. I mean, mobile eyes. That's that's a very very different or broad topic as well. And I can only give my my insights. So I think first it's important to measure reliable and valid data. And when it comes to eye movement, we don't have really good good data on that aspect. So there are no real devices which can measure that validly. And so there's also no way to yeah, base a decision on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Petr. Uh, thank you for, uh, for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, my, my question is about uh, the limits of, uh, of wearable technology, like uh, GPS or uh, health monitor, the limits of uh, wearable technology in on the rough training. The limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I could make a, a whole year about the limitations of, of wearable technologies in different training, and it really depends, as said, on the on the parameter you want to measure and the, the instance you are trying to use that parameter in. So some technologies are good, some are bad, but it really depends on your use case. And as said, we are I mean we hear a lot about algorithms, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, but <laughs> To be quite honest, we cannot even monitor the many, many parameters validly. And until we haven't solved that issue, we cannot do anything else. We need to start thinking about how can we make these devices more reliable, more valid. And I think we are on a good track on that. I mean, the, the devices are getting better every year, but I think the, the companies need to do a little bit more work in the accuracy or the validity of some data. And that's the main limitation we have nowadays. And without valid data, there is no valid informing of training procedures or decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer and for your presentation and to for your participation in our, our Congress. Thank you very much. Thanks for setting up the wonderful Congress. I'm curious about the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, finish with the, the the last presentation. Uh, I see Doctor Professor Wolfgang Schorhorn. Uh, if I, I pronounce better his name, so uh, Doctor uh, Professor uh, Doctor Wolfgang was a gymnast, handball player, decathlon, German uh, champion and European junior runner-up. And uh, for uh, four years, he trained national and international <coughs> athletes, karatikas, soccer, basketball, and tennis player for the top class. In 1990, he did his doctorate in biomechanics in Frankfurt and uh, completed his habilitation in 1996 in movement and training theory at the Sport University of in Cologne. Since 2007, he has been professor for training and movement science at the Johannes University in Mainz. Mainz. He work his work in is in uh, the field of uh, athlete, biomechanic, and motor learning, uh, and uh, has been uh, awarded several na national and international prizes. So, Professor, you have uh, about uh, 45 minutes to present as uh, your talk about uh, repetition hinders effective, effective learning. Uh, try differential learning. Okay, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Good. So, thank can you, you share? Much. Can you uh, share your also for, also for the previous uh, speaker, because I had some trouble with the computer and I needed this time. 
Uh, so thank you that he uh, took a little bit more uh, for this time. Well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the possibility to present you some of these weird, still weird ideas, and uh, I hope that I can uh, convince you from um, rethinking our old traditional uh, theories. Okay, uh, can you see my presentation? No, no. no. Can you share share our okay, yes, perspective? Okay, yes. Yes. Okay, now you can see. Uh, but not in uh, full screen. Okay. And now? Can you? Yes. Good. Yes. Difference or learn? Yeah. Okay. So this is topic what I'm talking about. And I already want to uh, show you the problem of repetition. So even in, in our reading, uh, we have uh, something different to do. Uh, that most of our letters are changing all the time because those contain the most information. Now, one of the biggest problems which we have is uh, considering learning over different uh, ages. And the problem is that very often we are trying to teach little children how to learn. Now, when we look to the learning rate, what we see here on, on, on the top, uh, which is learning the time, and on the horizontal we see the, the ages, different ages, we know that children during the first two years are learning the fastest what we know. With five, it's getting less, with ten, it's getting even lesser, and with ten, uh, the learning rate is almost close to zero. Now, when you think about it, what did you learn after having become uh, ten years old? You knew how to calculate, you knew how to read, you knew how to write. So, afterwards, I would say, not very much uh, has been added to this. Now, this was the reason why we said, okay, we have to turn the learning teaching system upside down, uh, and we did this by uh, looking for some characteristics uh, of little children. So what we were looking for is, okay, what happens during these certain ages, and what we see, okay, with two, very often the kinder come to kindergarten, with five they come to primary school, and with ten they go to secondary, uh, first and second level uh, school. Maybe this is only in Germany, but uh, I think in uh, most of the uh, countries uh, worldwide, it's the same. Now, we see with each event, the learning rate is decreasing. Now, we want to look what is the characteristics of children during the first two years. Because this time, they learn to walk, they learn to talk, they learn to eat, they learn to whatever. So, never later in life, we learn in the same uh, speed and we never learn in the same amount of content. So, in order to look for these, or look for models which could explain these, we found two areas. One area is related to neurophysiology, and the second area is related to system dynamics. The neurophysiological part, uh, it's related to a quite old uh, finding, uh, which has been investigated with uh, the kittens, because the kittens are born blind, and their visual system is developed within the first six weeks of their life. Now, in this experiment, the Google Visa single and similar uh, experiment, he was a teacher of mine, uh, they fixed the head of the kittens and they gave them just vertical lines for their visual stimuli. After six weeks, they removed everything and they let the, the children run, uh, the, the kittens run, and what happened? They stumbled down every stair because they were no longer able to uh, recognize horizontal lines. And they will never learn it again. Now, in order to control the system, they did the same experiment with horizontal lines, and there you had the same uh, uh, experience afterwards 
they uh, stumbled against each uh, chair, against each door, because they were no more able to recognize vertical lines. Now, what does it tell us? Um, our neural system is uh, just structuring contents uh, which are offered to them. If they are not offered, there is no need to structure this. Now, if you always repeat yeah. movements, then it's maybe structuring only a single uh, an event. And what we know meanwhile, okay, re uh, movements are never the same, uh, so it's getting a problem. And this was the first uh, evidence for neuroplasticity. Uh, and I think Google and Wiesenlake got the, the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, some of these applications you have heard yesterday uh, from uh, uh, the dancing uh, pr uh, presentation, uh, we were looking more for, for the fundamentals and for the principles behind them. So the, uh, what, happened, what went along with these learning things is that learning is changing the brain, and this is uh, realized a life, a lifelong. This is what you have seen yesterday with elderly when they dance, uh, it's still changing the brain. So it's uh, rather a, a problem of moving and uh, the environmental stimuli, then it's a problem of aging. Okay, there's a little bit of influence of aging, but mainly it's uh, about the behavior of the people. Now the second part of the new physiological uh, discovery was, uh, it was published here in 2002, but actually we knew this a little bit earlier, uh, it's called a power of neural adaptation. So when you give a stimuli to a neuron, always the same. For example, you touch the skin, the first time it's a big reaction there, the second time it's getting less and less, and mainly after three repetitions, the main adaptation is finished. So and this is one, one thing which we did uh, intuitively from the beginning. We said never more than three repetitions. And this doesn't matter whether it's uh, slowly adapting neurons or whether it's fast adapting neurons. Within three, uh, three repetitions, maybe the neurons have adapted. So biggest adaptation already after three repetitions. Now, the second area was related to the system's dynamics. The system's dynamics is related to physics. And uh, this was mainly um, or did, uh, a lot of progress. Uh, when the Nobel Prize was given to physics of living systems, non-equilibrium systems or dissipated systems from uh, Prigozhin. Now what is one characteristic of living systems is that they are always fluctuating. So you are breathing, you, you have a pulse, you are swinging when you are standing, you always have the fluctuations. Now one characteristic of these living systems is before they switch, from one state to another state, they pass a so-called instability, which is characterized by an enormous increase of fluctuations. And this was one of the uh, major issues uh, which um, in, uh, inspired for the learning area uh, quite a bit, that the fluctuations were no more considered as errors, which have to be avoided, but rather they are constructive. So actually, every little peak, what you see here, is a kind of, yeah, it's an instability, and the instability tells us where the system can learn. Uh, why are those uh, terms uh, uh, used? Stability is uh, related to mechanics. In mechanics, okay, stability means that you need a lot of energy to change the state. Instability is a moment where it's very easy to change the state. So for example, when you are laying down on the, on, the, on the floor, on the side, you're very stable. But when you're standing on one leg, you're very unstable. It needs only less amount of energy. Now, this has been transferred uh, by us uh, to learning, especially to learning, because now we can say, okay, when we see in our athletes these fluctuations, we have to increase these fluctuations to cause an instability because then the system will move faster to another stable state. And in most cases, it's a more effective, uh, more effective stable state. So if you have understood 
this, you can leave. Uh, so we have finished here. But as I uh, know, okay, it's, uh, it needs a little bit more explanation. So what we needed in movement science is we had to check this, whether this is happening in uh, cross-mode movements, not only finger movements, it's in cross-mode movements. So what we were looking for first was uh, uh, a movement which had a lot of repetitions for at least 30 year old people. So we let them walk over post and fold. Uh, we measured the, the current reaction forces. And in this case, we had 20 subjects. Every subject had to uh, repeat a movement uh, 20 times. And on the right side, you see already the red curves are the vertical forces. The green curves are the horizontal forces um, forward and backward. And the blue curves are sideways left and right the post curves. What you see first is that there is no identical post curve. And you can do millions of repetitions. You will never have the same curve twice. Is this nothing new? This is what the old Greek uh, said, Heraclitus, uh, you never will step into the same river twice. Um, the Chinese say the only constant uh, is variability. Now what we did in this case is we applied a neural um, a pattern recognition method uh, by means of neural nets. And what we found out is with in one cross contact, with one cross contact, we are able to recognize to recognize the person, which means that one front contact has the meaning of a fingerprint. It's very individual. Now the difference between a fingerprint and the force uh, pattern is that we additionally can identify identify emotions, we can identify fatigue, and we also can identify the type of music they are listening to. So it's highly, highly individual. But what we see is there is no repetition, even within the person, no repetition, which means, okay, we have shown that these instability, uh, these uh, fluctuations in the normal movements uh, occur. Now, already a question related to training. If a repetition will never occur twice. Why are we repeating in training? Because in our competition, the movement will be different anyways. Now, the second part was to check what happens when we increase the stability, the, in, uh, the instability. And this is what we call different learning, because we do different movements one of the other, in order to allow the systems to compare two different uh, events. And from information theory, we know only the comparison of two objects gives us information. Showing you the same object two times, the identical object, contains no information. Now, in our case, we let the we did a, a shot put experiment. Here we did this with Frank Usman. He was still a medalist in Decathlon. It's already some time ago. So he was a left hander. This is not the exercise. Now so here you can see uh, touching down the right leg and then do the shot move, uh, foot movement. During the touchdown of the leg, he's closing the right arm in order to uh, give a free stretch of the back muscle. Then he's standing already in this position. Nothing, uh, no movement in the leg, but in the, the trunk. Now it's the opposite. Now he's moving in the leg, but no, the, no movement in the trunk. Uh, now he's changing the initial conditions by hopping. It's, it gives a free stretch in, in, in the leg muscles. Now he's including the trunk muscles by means of uh, uh, diagonal trunk muscles. Uh, now he's increasing the fluctuations even more by 180 degrees. Now he's uh, activating the hip muscles. Uh, now he has a variant of the uh, approaching uh, double support. Due to double support, now he's closing the right arm. Uh, then it's a single support, a double support, and then double support in the middle, and then single support. The next exercise is single support, up in the middle, and shot put. Okay. This is just a selection of exercises which we did with him. With him, we did 60 exercises 
within one hour, the characteristics was no repetition and no correction. Just next, next, next. Because correction contains already information about the solution. And what we wanted to have is a real self conversation. In the conference center approach, you are telling them this is wrong, no, you have to go there. This is a guidance which has been known for more than 100 years. In our case, the system should find the, system, the solution by itself. Okay, now we did this in an experiment systematically uh, in a group of four students. And you see this already from the shot to distance, 6 minutes 50 till 7.50. Uh, we had a, a pretest. In the pretest, the subjects uh, in both groups shot 6.50, 6.51. Now, after four weeks of intervention, two sessions per week, uh, the classical group with repetitions and corrections improved their performance by almost 20 centimeters. Now, the other group, they had the same amount of sh shot puts, but in the percent way, within the same time, within four weeks, they improved their performance by almost 60 centimeters, which was already somewhat surprising. Now, in order to test the learning effect, we have to look how long this will uh, sustain. So we were looking for sustainability. So after having done the, the post-test, we had gave them a two-week break. And after two-week break, we uh, tested them again. And what would you expect? As a normal sports teacher in the classic group, normally I would uh, go for a vote here. OK, we cannot do this uh, in, in a digital version. But what most people expect is, OK, they stay on the same level, or they get a little bit of improvement. Now, the realist. Make, uh, most often say uh, what's really happening. So after two weeks, they are back to the, be uh, to the beginning level. Now, a similar behavior we would have expected from the differential group. Uh, uh, but what we saw there is, most surprisingly, a further increase by another 10 centimeters. Now, two more weeks. Uh, of break, so at least we had four weeks break after four weeks intervention. The traditional group, they stayed on the same level, fortunately, otherwise we would have had a, a, a problem to... Uh, Whether 
basis can improve the, the uh, rates by additional mental training because we thought it has to be uh, connected somehow with the brain. Now the design was a little bit different. We had a pretest that we gave all the beginners, they were absolute beginners, we gave all the students uh, three weeks an introduction to a differential training session with 30 athletes. Then we had an intermediate test and according to the intermediate test we parallelized three groups. One group had no training for another three weeks. Another group had um, some tennis literature, readings, and the third group had mental training sessions, three hours uh, per week, so overall nine sessions uh, in addition. Reading was the same, uh, nine, uh, nine hours of, of reading by mechanics and uh, psychology and all kinds of literature. Now the interesting part for us was this part. No more than precision, now it is about the learning. Learning is a change of behavior over time. Now these are the results. Okay, the, the test was a tennis serve, it was a, a target, and uh, here we measured the deviation, the improvement of the deviation. Now what would you expect with uh, no training group after three weeks doing nothing? Yeah, normally uh, you would expect nothing or a decrease, but it was a differential group, and when you have listened to the previous results, you see, okay, no training improved the performance by almost 60 centimeters. Now, when they got additional literature, what would you expect? Okay, more, but it's less than with differential training, by doing nothing. Now, in the mental group, they watched their videos, uh, and they uh, uh, draw out the key points of these videos and repeat this. Uh, this is classical learning. If your body is tired, then you can repeat the movement mentally, and hopefully uh, it will help. But what we see, it didn't help at all. And this can be proven statistically, okay? And uh, when you know statistics, you know how hard it is to, to get these uh, significant cells. The effect size was uh, big. It was a big effect size. Um, so we had a problem. How to explain this? Because originally we wanted, yeah, we wanted to have this uh, improvement, but surprisingly, and this is real science, uh, it went the other way around. Now, the, I would say the worry was just about ten, uh, two to five minutes, because immediately after this, or with this, we could enlarge our theory much more, and we got a wonderful verification. So mental training is only supportive under specific conditions. So be careful by saying uh, mental training has no effect. No, it has an effect with repetitive training, but not with together with uh, uh, differential training. Now, the idea, how to explain this, is going back to the assumptions which we have in our traditional training. The traditional model is assuming a steady model, so our body is stable and we can adapt in a neurological area. Now if this is true, this assumption, then it makes sense to start at the beginning with a lot of fluctuations and then decreasing the fluctuations with uh, progress. Now what we saw here already, in this case, uh, with the tennis experiment, what did they do? Three weeks of break. Now what did they do? Uh, I would say our body, after three weeks of doing nothing, changed. It will change. Now what did they, the, the mental group do? They re uh, watched their videos which were recorded three weeks ago. So the mental part stood on the same level, it was always the same, but the body changed. Now when the body is changing and the mind is different, then it's not good for performance. So what we see here already, when we assume that our system is changing all the time, 
the body is changing, the mind is changing, then we have to increase the fluctuations already from the beginning in order to cope with these changes. So it's mainly a problem of our assumptions. And this is exactly what children know because when little children grow, within one year they grow up to 10 centimeters. Within one year, the biomechanics is completely changing. So the neural system, neuromuscular system, has to adapt. And in this case, it doesn't make sense to repeat. So when you repeat a movement on the 1st of January, in the December, at the end of, uh, of the year, the body is completely different, and the uh, logic of control has no, more, uh, has no more, more sense there. So we had a wonderful explanation why we need to adapt. Uh, we, had this, uh, we conducted this experiment with students in the uh, age between 20 and 30. So what we see already there, between 20 and 30, the bodies are also changing. Now we know from juveniles, they are growing a lot. Okay, the elderly, I can feel it already too. The body is changing as well. Uh, but the most studies have been conducted uh, with uh, subjects between 20 and 40 years. And this is one of the reasons why not a lot of uh, those studies can be uh, generalized. Now, this led us immediately to uh, yeah, do some investigation about the reliability and stability of the individual. In this case, we did the same analysis for gains, but uh, kinematics and dynamics together. Uh, with the video and the force platforms, here you see the force platforms. So in day one, they came in, into the laboratory and repeated the same gate 15 times. And you see there is a, a small uh, tube, standard deviation tube around an average. Now, the next day they came and they did it eight days in a row without any intervention, just coming every day at the same time, doing the same movement, nothing else. Now, in the second experiment, we did uh, the same in a shorter time scale. We did the same within one day. So they came into a laboratory, they did these 15 repetitions, they had a 10 minute break, again 15 repetitions, then they had half an hour break, 15 repetitions, and then uh, again 10, half an hour, 10, and so on. This gate patterns has been analyzed with more sophisticated uh, methods, with uh, deep learning algorithms, and what we see from the first experiment of different days, you see on the left side, from the same subject on different days, dark green and bright green uh, curves, we can see them, the difference already visually. Now, when we go for these uh, parametric things, uh, although we had, uh, I think it was 15 subjects, we had a subject classification of 100%. Again, I think of it. But, most surprisingly, we had an eight-day classification also of 95%. What does this mean? Within one day, for us, your gait pattern has changed by 95%. We can separate them by 95%. And the random classification uh, would be 12.5%. It's 1 divided by uh, 8. It's 12.5. Now, in the second, uh, study was in the same day. You see here uh, again one subject, uh, three different uh, sets of trials. On the right side, you see the statistics, and you see after 10 minutes, the separation between the different gate patterns was 71%, but already after half an hour, the gate pattern has changed by 85%. After two hours, two to three hours, we had 92%. Just by repeating, now you can imagine what happens when you do training in between, when you get fatigued. When you get fatigued, we had a, a similar study, and we see within one, uh, one training session, the pattern has changed quite a lot. So repetition is for sure not to find an, an, an ideal solution. 
Now this brought us to another area. Okay, learning is individual and situation specific. Yesterday you have heard already uh, with uh, responders and non-responders, it's individual, yes, we knew this uh, since 1995 uh, uh, from Bouchard. Uh, some people respond and some not, but separations to individuality. No, in a, and uh, in direct connection to this, also related to yesterday, uh, the topic of the replication crisis. Because with this approach, what we show here, is we suggest some solutions to go another way. Now, with respect to individuality, the term individual has been used for years. For the case, it's individual. But in most cases, it has because of ignorance of systematics. They couldn't find a classification, then they say it's individual. This is not very scientific, this is an excuse. And at the moment, it's a fashion to use the term individual, especially in the Western hemisphere. Uh, it has to be individual. Uh, Okay, this could be, it's uh, popular, but it's not science. In science, we are talking about individuality rather in a forensic sense. Now, individuality has to survive a court trial. What is the necessity for this? The characteristics have to be persistent. It doesn't matter whether you do this today, tomorrow, or in one year, it has to be the same. And this is what we did, not only within day, one day and different days, we did the same over years. And we found this exactly. And the second important criteria, it has to be unique. So today it has to be separated from other trials, and tomorrow and in one year it has to be separated as well. So only when these two criteria are fulfilled, and they have to be checked with uh, these uh, bigger statistics, uh, it's a base statistic, then uh, we talk about individuality. Otherwise, it's a popular fashion thing. With respect to replication crisis, you have heard yesterday already, only the first approach. Now, what we know in uh, science theory, in epistemology, is meanwhile, it's discussed that there are three approaches. One, you have heard yesterday, they play for stricter rules, they play for greater n, they play for smaller p, p 0.0001. The problem with this is that the fundamental problem with Fisher 9 field statistics is not solved. Because with this kind of statistics which is applied there, we only can say something about the probability of finding data in case that the hypothesis is, is true. I can recommend the literature of Kigurenzo, the title is Mindless Statistics. Most people believe that you test the probability of a hypothesis, which is not true. This is wrong. We are testing under the assumption that the hypothesis is true, we will find the probability to find data. And this doesn't change if you take greater n or if you uh, use smaller p. Now, a second uh, suggestion was uh, made by Mayo in five that we should be more tolerant by publication uh, in order uh, to avoid the publication bias. Because at the moment, most uh, journals only accept statistically significant results, uh, yeah, which is mainly nothing else than p-hacking. They play for more unsuccessful, non-significant experiments should be published. Now, a completely different approach, I call this the revolutionary approach, suggested by a lot of philosophers, is, okay, they accept that the classical statistics has been derived from physics. And especially in psychology, there's a kind of physics envy. Now, physics has the advantage that they have so-called rigid bodies. And they have several hundred years to investigate the density, the volume, the shape, the surface, and whatever, for this subject. Now, we are dealing with living subjects. And one major characteristic, as we have seen earlier, of uh, living subjects is that living subjects are changing all the time. 
So this is one aspect which science has not been uh, investigated enough. We don't know exactly what our body is doing. The characteristics of our object of uh, uh, focus is not investigated correspondingly. And this is what some uh, the biologists suggest is this is the reason why we should rethink completely the replication problem by causing local stabilities uh, which are uh, spatial, uh, spatially local and temporally local. So uh, it's about what uh, I demonstrated already, okay, within one day, how fast is a biological system changing? Uh, can we say is this between 20 and 30 years, or is it the same between the first two years? It's temporally uh, different. And what we know from shoe research, uh, sports shoe research, is that the feet in, in, in Asia are having a different anatomy than in, in the Western Hemisphere. So they needed to change the uh, structure of the, of the shoe, so it's a spatial repli uh, replicability uh, as well. In one of the most promising methods, which is uh, um, recommended in this case, is we should apply more base statistics. Now, we were interested uh, more in how can we include the other approaches. The other approaches, okay, we have the repetitive learning, uh, in repetitive learning, we have this constant part, but we all already know that uh, there's no repetition twice, so we had a very little part. Please, the the was an exercise. Yes? Uh, yeah, one more minute, please. One minute. Okay, yeah. and then I will skip this. Okay, you see different approaches, and these approaches can be summarized in one, uh, in one theory, and this theory uh, is telling us that uh, we need a kind of resonance and the resonance of instructions have to be ad uh, adapted to the frequency of the, of the athlete. So all the approaches have the same uh, idea that the fluctuations uh, have to be uh, adapted. So what uh, comes out of this is that we always uh, only have learned from differences. But in repetitions, uh, in repetition learning, they are too small for effective learning. Now, for this, we, sorry, I can skip this, go ahead. Uh, we were looking for the brain activation together with this, and what you see here is from the left, uh, the repetition uh, approach uh, leads to actually shut down the brain, and the more variation you have towards the right, the more active the brain becomes. And the most important frequencies are the lower frequencies uh, in the alpha and theta rhythm, uh, and this is what uh, has been activated the most by variations uh, through chaotic uh, differential learning. This has been applied to uh, mathematics as well, so we can apply differential learning to prepare the brain for better learning, and what we saw there is uh, in addition that when you do differential road skipping before mathematics learning, then uh, you learn much more, much faster than when you do only uh, repetitive movement, but when you do repetitive movements, then you learn even more when, than when doing nothing. So we have the same, what we have heard yesterday already, uh, that by means of the movements, we can change the brain state. So coming to the summary, brain states can be changed by specific sequence of movements. The second uh, consequence is training should be that difficult in order to make competition for registration. This is a basketball field uh, in Munich. Uh, if you are able to play basketball there, uh, I think everything uh, will be boring for you. The same we have discovered in Denmark in a, a football field. And if this is not enough for you, uh, you can do it in, in uh, this way. Now take our message. Uh, we can skip this. If we open a new door or we shut a new door, it's up to you. I with, if you read a lot, you only think with other people's heads. I'm running out of time, and I think you are much for a different thoughts. <laughs>